And good evening once again, fellow writers and creative types all across the universe. Um, welcome back to the Monday evening stream where we where we talk writing and all creative things associated with it. It's always good to be back. And uh, thank you for turning up. We are still on a quest for um, <laughs> replacement music, as some of you have already noticed in the chat. So apologies for the slightly... Um, <laughs> <laughs> monotonous tune. It was the best one I could find, actually. Uh, I'm still searching uh, for a, a my, my, my my tune. My my tune. Well, it's not my tune. Um, the tune I've been using for like <laughs> I don't know a decade suddenly has um, got me into trouble on YouTube for reasons I can't actually understand. Um, so um, it, it's 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 causing me all sorts of copyright strike issues, which I'm which I'm fighting. I'm fighting. I am fighting. Um, but um, until it's resolved, it's kind of like. <sighs> Yeah, you know, and, and Google is just—you can't talk to anybody. This is what's so annoying. I mean, this is this is this is okay. This is a this is a general waffle complaint. I'm going to start with before we start anything else. Um, is you can't you can't talk to anybody anymore. It's in, it doesn't matter what service you rig up about. It's always press one if you're an existing customer. Press two uh, if you're not an existing customer. Press three if, if you want to speak to the accounts department. Speak four for sales. Speak five for the, something else. Speak six if you're really really fed up. Press seven. Uh, press seven if you don't like the number six. Press eight um, if you if you like big numbers. You know it's ah. Oh, it's like I just want to talk to somebody. Can't I please just talk to somebody like in the good old days when you had to dial things? Who remembers those? Ah oh, dear. Press eleven if you want to dispute. Yeah, but there's no eleven but on there, is it? Oh, I hate them. I hate them. I hate it. I hate it. It's horrible. This modern world with all its technology. 
which allows me to do things like this. Uh, but there we go, never mind. Anyway, right, my friend, sorry, 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 I must do my thing because we should do things. Come on, the Sodak is here, the Hulkonians are here, fresh from the invasion of Arrakis. Wintermute GB is here, of course, of course, Arrakis is here, fighting off the invasion of the Hulkonians. Mad Monks off Blue Ganymede, Commander Terra Firma is on a dodgy internet connection, but never mind. The Shadow Wyvern is here, Kelly Bagler is here, the Lander is here, DJ Scribby is here, Commander GR 1988 is here, Commander Duskthorn is here. Uh, Lucky Luigi and Alan is here. Excellent. <laughs> the crew has arrived. And welcome, and welcome, of course, to anybody who's lurking, watching the stream behind the scenes. And Zen's, and Zen's, oh, sorry, Zen's, Zen's Bob. Hello, Zen's Bob. And welcome to anybody who's lurking behind the screen. You don't have to join into uh, the, uh, the, um, the chat if you don't feel comfortable okay if you just want to watch that's absolutely fine by me it's not a problem um it's nice to have you aboard regardless of whether you want to say anything or not there are there are serial lurkers and there are serial commentators and that's all kind of good <laughs> house house of house of um a pate maybe a pate i'm not sure um i never know how to pronounce these things a first time chat a lurker coming out into the wild thank you welcome to you as well uh <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent stuff. Um, hexadecimal keypad for the week. Yeah, I, I don't know. Oh, dear. I just... I, I just so annoyed. I don't mind being able to send a, an email, right, to a something and somebody answers it. Yeah, that's okay. Because that, I'm, you know, you may be surprised to know, some of you, that I am quite an introvert. I don't like talking to people on telephones. I don't, I don't like telephones at all, actually. They interrupt you when you're working. Um, <laughs> things like that. And yeah, I, I just find the whole telephone thing not... <laughs> Not very conducive. I like sending an email and I like getting the answer back. It doesn't have to be immediately, but the next day would be nice, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and um, But this business of, of listening to some automated thing. And of course, what the automated thing always does, have you noticed, you, you ring up a number and it says press one for whatever it is that you're after. So you press one, it says, did you know? Did you know that the thing that you're ringing us up about, you can probably do online at www.wasteyourtime.com. And you go, and you're, of course, me being me, as I'm actually already talking to the automated thing at this time, saying, I've been on your website. <laughs> if I found what I wanted on your website, do you think I'd be ringing you up now? <laughs> so, of course, the bot on the other end doesn't seem to understand my, uh, my sarcasm. And... Uh, <laughs> just blindly continues on with its spiel, which is uh, which is just dreadful. Anyway, that's got absolutely not. Oh, you sent an email, you get an automated reply. Um, the one that really, really, I, I don't know if this translates internationally, but the one that really winds me up is, um, your call is very important to us. Please stay on the line and one of our people will get to you as soon as possible. Uh, to which I always respond with, if my call was so damned important to you, you'd have more bloody staff working, wouldn't you? <laughs> so, um, but anyway, never mind. <laughs> That's my rant of the evening done. Uh, okay, so I feel <laughs> it's very cathartic, okay? <laughs> so basically, you're, you're, <laughs> I would, I, wouldn't it be nice just every so often if marketing and sales and stuff like that was actually 100% honest? Um, so when you rang up, you'd get something like, um, your call is averagely important to us. Um, we, we haven't got as many staff as we'd like to have because of budget cuts. Um, and frankly, we just don't want to spend that much on marketing <laughs> and sales support because we've already got your money because you've bought our service. But that aside, we will get around to you eventually if you stay on the line. Um, we understand this is costing you money, but that's better than costing us money, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what it should say, uh, but never mind. <laughs> so dear, <laughs> I love it when the voice says, "You know when you can visit." Oh, yeah, exactly the point. Yeah, I've been to your website. Your website's appalling, uh, and I've already tried to find my answer. That's why I'm bringing you up. And I've managed to track down an actual telephone number because your website didn't give me that either, did it? Uh, if sales wanted you would never buy anything. Uh, <laughs> yes. This deodorant won't change your life in any way at all. <laughs> you know, beautiful women, stroke delete men, stroke whatever your personal preference is, will not throw themselves at you as a result of you buying this deodorant. Uh, all this soap, all this shampoo. Uh, <laughs> this car will never exist on the roads that are completely empty and driving through blank forests uh, on gorgeous summer evenings. It'll always be stuck in traffic. <laughs> Oh dear. 
So, uh, yeah, I don't know. But uh, it's, a, it's a funny old world, isn't it? Um, anyway, that's got nothing to do with what I'm supposed to be doing tonight. So apologies for my waffle, because uh, that's, that's, a, that's a habit I'm prone to. It's one of the things we do. But we will, we will crack on, <laughs> because I've got to keep the waffle to a minimum to make sure we actually get some quality content into the stream. I know that's an unusual thing for this stream, but uh, we <laughs> I'm going to try anyway. Um, right, so to <laughs> tonight's show, <laughs> dare I call it a show? It's a stream, isn't it? It's supposed to be informative. That's what I'm, that's what I'm aiming for. Um, Tonight's show is all about how to plan a novel, okay? And um, the idea, and, and basically what I'm going to show you is how I do it, okay? Because I'm not competent to speak on um, you know, generic plans for, for planning a novel, because I do it my way, and um, it works for me. Now, this isn't the only way to plan a novel, okay? It's not the only way to plan a novel. There are plenty of ways to plan novels. Um, some people seem to do an awfully excellent job when not planning a novel at all. Those people are just using magic, okay? Um, so um, uh, I'm not quite sure how that works, but that's, that's not how I do it. Um, so to start off, there's, there's two words you kind of need to know, all right? There's, there's, there's two words you need to know when you're starting off writing a book. Either, okay, either you're a plotter or you're a panster, okay? Uh, <laughs> those are the two types of writers, okay? Uh, there are lots of other two types of writers, but these are the two important ones for this evening. Plotters and pantsters, right? We are primarily going to be concerned with the first type, okay? Um, pants, uh, pantsters, should I say, um, are people who have this magic, magic ability, okay? What they do is they just go, today I'm going to be brilliant. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write a story. And they do. <laughs> okay, they just, here we go! <laughs> Just sort of dive in and start typing the boom. You know, a few months later, there's a story, okay? It's called writing by the seat of your pants. Now, I can't do that, okay? I can't do that. At least I can't do it with my types of novel. I think, uh, I, I, in the UK, is it not called trousering instead of pantsing? <laughs> because the origin of the phrase um, pantster uh, comes from from the seat of your pants, which of course in, in America is trousers, isn't it? In the, well, in the UK it's trousers rather than pants. Pants in the UK are the underwear uh, that you wear. I think, what, what are they called in the States? Is it just called underwear? What, what, what do you, what, the things that you wear underneath your pants in America, what do you, what do you call them? Because in the UK we have trousers, which are go over the top. They're the long things, okay? And then we have pants, which are the things that go in between the trousers and, 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 and the other things that we obviously can't mention. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, uh, <laughs> um, thank you for love, the underwear. So, yeah, so um, in the UK, is it not trousering? No, tr <laughs> trousering in the UK. If you, if, you are, if you are trousering, you're drinking quite a lot, okay? Uh, so, uh, um, in English, uh, there's there's a way basically to say that you're drunk, okay, without actually saying you're drunk. What you do is you just take a noun and verbify it. So you can be completely trousered, okay, <laughs> uh, or completely. I go, I've been completely Wellington tonight. <laughs> got completely trousered the other day. Uh, <laughs> Mad Monk's off has got it. Okay, and so maybe knickers in the air, chonies, skivvies, briefs, underwear. Okay, there's all sorts of things different, of course. So. Um, uh, I'm completely gazebo, said Samantha. So basically, yeah, in the, in the UK, at the moment at least, this is in vogue, you can take a noun and you can just verbify it and that, that basically acts as drugs. You can get completely trousered. Everyone knows what you mean. Okay. <laughs> so it's a bit strange. Anyway, so, so pantsters, okay, pantsters. Trolleyed, yeah, trolleyed is another one, yeah. You can be completely trolleyed. If you are completely trolleyed. <laughs> so I'm not a pantster, I'm a knicker. Totally plastered, that's another, that's an old one, but that's a good one. You can be totally plastered, okay? So if you're totally plastered, this is why the English language is such a good thing, you see, because um, you can just keep reinventing things over and over and over again. Hammered, yes, it's all very good. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's all good. So anyway, so pantsters, okay? Pantsters are writers who don't need a plan, essentially. They get inspired in the moment and can write from beginning to end and just, there you go, there, there's, your, there's your novel. I don't know how they do that, okay? <laughs> totally pebble touched, very, very good. <laughs> um, so um, so I, I don't know how they do it. Now, I, I, this may or may not be true, okay? But I, th you know, I suspect, this, this is in my defense, I'm kind of hoping this is true, it may not be, um, that pantsters can 
do what they do because they've kind of they're following a traditional story structure perhaps so it, um so if you're doing dare i say it's something i don't want to use the word simple because that's 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 being really demeaning um shall i say straightforward if you're using a straightforward structure with you know kind of um crisis resolution crisis resolution crisis major crisis before end of the book <gasps> resolution um maybe you can write a panster you, you can you can panster that kind of a novel okay i'm so true <laughs> that's a good one um <laughs> stop distracting me you're very very bad um so i think that's maybe i mean anybody who in the chat who writes and is a panster maybe 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 disagree with me on that one that's kind of the impression i get now if you're writing i i feel something complicated where it's a you know it's a bit politically intriguey or it's twisty and there's there's plot reveals that need to happen but not too early because then the reader the, you know the reader sorry the writer doesn't <laughs> there's a sort of weird combination of reader and writer there a reader <laughs> apologies to any readers in the chat um so um <laughs> Not to be very well. I think I need another drink. I haven't even had a drink. That was most annoying. Um, so yeah. So um, with the um, if it's a, if it's complicated and you've got plot twists and you've got reveals and you've got MacGuffins and all those sorts of things in there that you need to drop in and drop out at particular points in the story and maybe misdirect the reader a little bit and maybe you know send them off down the, oh I wonder if it's going to happen this way oh it didn't you know and there's um you know there's a plot twist in there a big big switcheroo those kind of things to me those things do have to be planned okay to a degree okay I'm not saying you work out absolutely everything in advance because you know you, you still got to have a space for creativity in there but you kind of do need a bit of a plan okay a bit of a plan that basically brings you know, some structure to it and make sure the plot of the story actually works kind of from beginning to end. That's my impression. That's <laughs> that's my working assumption for tonight's stream. Um, uh, if that isn't the case, and I'm talking complete trousers, then <laughs> feel free to uh, <laughs> feel free to uh, to, yeah, to disagree. Um, so um, needing another drink before the first drink is a worrying sign. It's, yes, it's a cunning plan. Yes, it's a cunning plan, DJ Scribby. That's exactly what you need. You need a cunning plan. But what's you know, the question is okay so what does a plan look like and how do you go from ah, i've got a bit of an idea for a book to actually okay well this is what i'm actually going to do to deliver the book and as i've mentioned before on these streams it, you know planning a novel isn't just sitting down and writing the thing and going okay what well, what's the plot okay that's that's a that's a big thing okay you need to have a plot all right <laughs> there used to be a yeah you know, what's the events in the story okay um but you also need potentially how am i going to deliver this when do i need to get this done by if there's any kind of deadline involved okay um now if you're in the nice position of actually you didn't need to worry about deadlines um then um yeah, that's great but you it's sometimes you know for me personally it's good for me to have a deadline otherwise i, <laughs> I prevaricate and put it off okay um so um so yeah, so um, it, your mileage may vary on that, but some people find deadlines really, really you know, oppressive and unpleasant. Other people like me find that it really focuses the mind and forces them to work harder. So yeah, so, so bear that in mind. Um, uh, Drew, what's the best link to buy your novels? Um, Amazon's probably the easiest one to build. It's just go to Amazon, search for me, you'll, you'll find myself. Um, so so yeah so um and glenn makes a good point here commander terraform i find myself being overwhelmed by all the possible ways i could go with characters and plot and i want to write down all my ideas but find it hard to write the to plan and narrow it down so i think most writers experience that the sort of overwhelming yeah really good ideas but how can i distill that down into something that i can actually manage and that sort of um almost pressure that's in your mind of trying to like i've got all these brilliant ideas but how do i how do i consolidate that into um, into something to um and that is that is difficult that is difficult um now depending on the way you start your story and it depends very much on the type of story you're writing okay so i'm focusing here again on fictional uh fictional stories uh, so if you're if you're looking around for um, how do I write a you know a, a reference book on a uh, on a nonfiction topic I, I can't help you I'm afraid I have no idea how you go about doing that um, 
so you know so apologies for that this is this is fiction okay it's it's, it's all about fiction um um, I specialise in science fiction and fantasy, but I think the techniques are kind of the same across any kind of literary fictional sort of stuff. I don't think it changes all that much, really. The detail, obviously, the specifics, yes, but um, uh, not, not anything else. Um, what's the best link to buy your... Oh, I've already read that one. Uh, what was the other question? Uh, something about... Um, uh, I've lost it. Oh, no. Chat's moving too fast for me. Sorry. Um, <laughs> is the plan of ah? Oh, there we go. Big Bang, Big Bang Theory. Is the plan a visual thing? Um, for me, it's a document, uh, and sometimes an Excel spreadsheet. If I'm feeling really, really, really organised. Um, um, the 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 thing I find with the plan is if I don't have a plan, my book doesn't turn out very well. And um, one thing I really don't like when I'm reading somebody else's book is things like plot holes. Um, you know, you know the kind of stuff. Um, um, I mean, let, let's take a really, a really straightforward one. Okay, Star Wars. Okay, everyone knows Star Wars, right? Um, um, yeah, the original film, Episode Four, A New Hope. Okay, Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Han Solo. Great, great, great film. Great story. Yeah, can't really complain about it. But massive, overwhelming plot hole at the end. Okay, um, <laughs> which is glaringly obvious even now. Well, two actually. Um, one of which I think has been explained in there, or the other one really can't be. Um, the first one is, okay, so um, yeah, they've, they've tracked Princess Leia and the Millennium Falcon back to the, the base on Yavin, right? Um, and the Death Star is coming in to destroy the Rebel base, okay? Now, the, <laughs> the Death Star manages to come out of hyperspace in such an orientation that it's actually between the, the big planet Yavin and the little moon, okay? <laughs> Spoilers, says W. Yeah. Don't think I can be accused of spoilers for a film that came out in 1977 before an awful lot of you were even born. Um, so, you know, anybody knows a little bit about space? I mean, uh, you'd have to be trying really, 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 really hard, OK, for to get your super planet destroying Death Star to come out of hyperspace in a position where the moon that you were wanting to attack was eclipsed by the big planet in the middle of the system. Okay, <laughs> you'd have to try really, 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 really hard, okay, <laughs> to do that. And yet, that's the plot device that delays the attack long enough that the rebels can get their X wings over to the Death Star. Luke Skywalker can do his thing. Han Solo can do his thing, and it's all home for for two medals, except for Chewbacca, of course. Um, who didn't get one until <laughs> much, 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 much later on. So that is a plot hole, okay? That is a contrivance, which is a bit annoying, okay? It's just one of those things that doesn't really make any sense. And it's only there because we need to have a delay, otherwise the Death Star, the bad guys win. And that's, you know, dare I say it, is not good writing, okay? It's, it's not good writing. Um, so, if you can identify things like that in your plot, in your plan, prior to writing your book, okay, um, you're going to end up with a story that makes more sense and is a bit more consistent with itself and is a stronger story, okay? Um, but, you know, the countdown clock, yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong with having a countdown clock <laughs> as long as you can weave it. I mean, an easier way to do that particular thing was to you know if i'd been writing that and i was in charge of removing plot holes from star wars at that particular point what i would have suggested is why don't we just it takes 20 minutes to charge the laser and then they've got 20 minutes to shoot it down before it can fire you know it makes a lot more sense than having to orbit the planet in order to get it yeah you know, so that's the sort of thinking process you can go through if you, you pay attention to the plot holes um, well, and mighty seconds, that's exactly the point. Yeah, if they could have just, if they could you know, <laughs> just popped out a little bit further around or a bit further above or a bit further below, they could just go, there's the rebel base, you know, <laughs> etc. Okay, um, so, you know, just introduce it. Yeah, it doesn't, you just make it up. I mean, it's still made up, right? It's still fiction. It's still fantasy, etc. It takes 20 minutes to charge the massive laser beam on the Death Star. Perfectly reasonable explanation. Makes more sense, okay? Um, so there's no problem having countdown clocks and things like that to increase tension because they're, you know, all those sort of vibes are in, um, you, know, uh, uh, you know, classic mechanisms for introducing tension. You know, the countdown clock, you know, the rope burning through, you know, the, 
<laughs> crocodiles wanting to eat you. All of those sort of things are um, you know, tension creating devices. Uh, so you know, so that's 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 an obvious kind of thing. Now you can avoid that if you look at your plot and look at your plan. Okay. Um, now next week we'll be touching on kind of the world building um, aspect of things as well. But there's, there's part of that in there. Now in order to bring this alive a bit, and rather than just me being a talking head on the screen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of my books that I wrote. And it's believe it or not, it's nearly ten years ago now. Um, I was writing it in 2013. Um, and uh, um, so it's, it's it, you know it's it's kind of ancient history for me now, but it it shows you how I deconstructed the problem and you know, I've got a blank version of the template. If it's of any use to you guys, you can hop on my Discord and go grab it uh, after the event. Um, so if um, uh, to, to give you a bit of introduction to it, so I. Um, got the opportunity to write a book called Reclamation for a, a, a video game called Elite Dangerous. Now, most of you on the chat will probably have heard this. Um, and um, it's, so it's an official book. It's kind of licensed, you know, officially licensed by the people who made the video game. And I had to write it about the universe that the video game is in um, as the video game itself was being created. In fact, slightly before the video game uh, was being created, we wrote uh, me, me and a bunch of other authors actually wrote this video, these, these books to accompany the launch of the video game, if that makes sense. Um, so um, not only did I have to uh, make sure the book kind of matched the game as it was beginning to emerge, you know, you had to write a proper book as well um, that you know, could potentially stand on its own because not everybody who plays video games reads books and not, not everybody who reads books write, you know, plays video games. Um, but um, and there, there's obviously a crossover that you know, quite a lot of people do. But my, my kind of success criteria was A, the, the book has to, you know, reinforce the game and help you know, promote the game. Um, but B, it's got to stand on its own. So somebody who's never played a video game, someone that has no intention of playing a video game, but does like kind of science fiction -y sort of stuff, could pick up this book and go, yep, I can understand exactly what's going on in here. Um, at the same time, bearing in mind that quite a lot of people who are reading this book are going to be people who um, know the video game inside out and know all the little details and all that sort of stuff. So I've got to make sure I get that stuff right as well. So there's quite a lot of inputs to, to writing this thing. Um, so, uh, so, so there we go. So um, um, what does it look like? Well, the way I did it is, is, is as follows. I'm going to jump to my screen here, so hopefully this works. Um, so I, you know, I, I do everything in documents. <laughs> um, so the first thing I actually started working on with this particular book. So it's a science. Okay, so to set the scene for those of you who don't know, it's a um, quite anarchic kind of universe. So uh, it's sort of um, take the tramp steamer model of the late eighteenth, well, so probably no, probably mid nineteenth century. Okay, so yeah, the idea of you know, small independent owner operator ships trading between exotic ports. Okay, move that into space. Um, you know, a thousand years or whatever in the future, and um, so you have small spaceships plying their wares, basically buying low, selling high. There's piracy. There's um, bounty hunters. There's um, you know, trading and it's all dodgy deals in the back room and all that sort of stuff. Okay, so it's, it's a quite a rich environment for storytelling. Um, there are some maybe rumours of some weird aliens on the outside edge. Um, we've explored a certain amount of space, but not beyond a certain range. So there's sort of like a boundary beyond which nobody really knows what's out there, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's lots of rich storytelling um, kind of environments. Um, and um, there is a whole also quite interesting for this sort of thing, um, and this is different to potentially an, uh, an ordinary book. Um, is there's a whole bunch of established law as well. So there's this history, if you like, that's gone before the story quite a long way back. Um, there was a you know one of the things that we did get um, from the for the people who produced the video game was a timeline of events um, that actually some of the fans had worked out. <laughs> <laughs> not not the video game company. The fans had worked out roughly what had happened since the year dot and then up to now, and then um, the video game company went, yeah, that's that's a good piece of work. Rubber stamp. Yeah, it's official now. <laughs> that's basically how that happened. Um, but yeah, at least that that law detail was there, um, and some so so some of the background work 
had been done. Okay, here's a basic history of you know, humanity and stuff. Um, here's when they did this, and here's when this technology was invented, and here's when the spaceships went went out, and so on and so forth. This is when that system got colonized, and da 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 da. So some of that detail that was there in the background was was kind of codified and, and available. So you've got a nice rich storytelling environment. It's it's sort of kind of the wild west in space, really. Um, it's um, a bit anarchic. Okay, so uh, in this universe, um, you know, people don't bat an eyelid if you know people get blown to pieces. Okay, if, if your spaceship goes up out there, doesn't come back, everyone goes, "Hey, well, it happens." You know, <laughs> it's, there's no investigation. Okay, so the idea of there being you know spaceships out there that never came back and there you know rumors of ghost spaceships and all sorts of things like that, um, you know, abound in this universe. Um, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's that's the sort of scenario which this science fiction story was was uh, you know was coming together, um, and. Um um, the, Glenn says, this is a good question actually, uh, did you find that as you were a few books into Shadewood, Shadewood is my own sci-fi sci series by the way, not a, not a video game novelisation, um, and as you're starting a new series, do you find early established lore is harder to work around? It depends how well you've planned, Glenn. So what I did with Shadewood is I planned all four books at the same time. So what I actually did was I wrote a, a, a plot that was four books long. And then I chopped it up into pieces. It, it was actually five books originally. And when I looked at it, I thought, actually, there's not quite enough material here for five books. I'm going to turn it into four. So I wrote the entire plot end to end for Shadewood. Uh, so, you know, I knew who was going to die and who was going to live and what was going to happen. All the major events, I plotted it out all the way through and then broke it up into separate books. I'm doing the same with my current um, four book series as well. I'm writing the plot end to end. So I know the entire thing works before I embark on on writing book one, if that makes sense. Um, so, um, so Mad Monks, yeah, it's a shame Hobbit film writers didn't do this. Yeah, you know, so a lot of films suffer. And this is why, I'd, you know, as a, as a bit of an aside, why I'd be very nervous having any of my material turn into a, a film or a TV. Um, you know, the, the money and the fame would be lovely. Well, maybe the money, <laughs> not sure about the fame. Um, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. But take that aside for a moment. Um, a book series gets transmogrified when it gets turned into a different media. And um, I'm not, you know, there's always a danger that if your your thing, whatever it happens to be, doesn't do well in ratings or at the box office, what happens, it gets cut short, okay? And then you're left with a, a, an awful unfinished piece of work or something even worse that's sort of tidied up really, really sharply at the end to try and make it make sense, which maybe doesn't bear any resemblance to the, the book that you originally wrote. So unless I could guarantee that my, my, my stories would be faithfully converted in their entirety, you know, across multiple TV series, um, I wouldn't be all that happy about it. Of course, that can't happen because each series effectively funds the next one. So there is a danger in all those kind of things. Um, so, so that's how I do it. Now, I do try and put... Now, I'm not saying um, everybody has to... If they, if they want to write a four book series, they have to jump out and go, right, I'm going to plot the entire series into it. That's how I do it. But I've only been able to do that after many, many years of experience. Let's keep it down to one book. That's why I chose this example rather than my Shadewood series, actually, because um, Shadewood is much more involved. It's actually a much more complicated set of stories than this, this, this video game one was. Um, but this one has some complexities in it as well. And although it's only a single book, it does demonstrate the sort of things that you have to, to work with. So basically what I did is I, okay, and so, so anybody who hasn't read Elite Reclamation, uh, spoilers ahead, alas. Um, <laughs> now this book has been out for like almost 10 years, so hopefully anybody who, who wanted to read it has read it by this point. Um, so the first thing I worked on, okay, the first thing I worked on was how do I amalgamate the law that I've been given um, with where I want my story to start, okay? Um, so what I'd started with is the backstory, okay? Uh, Big Bang Theory, do you have any books on all the border? Yes, uh, this one is. Um, <laughs> and my entire Shadewood series is on Audible as well. So if you again, if you look me up on Audible, you'll find me. I think I've got five books there. I've got another one that I'm working on at the moment. Um, uh, and I've sort of made a commitment that I will get all of my 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 kind of real books, if you like, that's not quite the right word. Uh, physical books, no, that's not even right. My, my, my traditional word books, 
because paperback and ebook. Anyway, I'm converting to Audible with a delay of about two years. Okay, um, if that makes sense. So I'm you know I'm converting my my catalog of of not real, real books is wrong, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> books, traditional books, to Audible. But I'm about two years behind, if that makes sense. Uh, printed. Well, they're not all printed. Well, I'm thinking of Kindles and stuff. That's not printed, is it? Um, so, um, um, so there we go. Would I accept an inspired by kind of deal, similar to Blade Runner and Total Recall, where they change the book and make clear that this is a different book? Um, well, I'd, we'd, we'd certainly sit down and have a jolly nice lunch. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way. Um, so, um, uh, but I, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, I think I think Shade Wood would actually make a really good TV series. It wouldn't make a good film, I don't think. It's too long. Um, and each individual book doesn't kind of make a film, if that makes sense. It kind of works as a book, but I don't think it would work as a film. Uh, so I don't know how that would be done. But uh, it's not a problem I'm having to worry about right now, of course. But there we go. So the first thing I did, work out the backstory. Okay, so what happened immediately before the story, okay, uh, what, what's the setup? What's what's the ploy? Um, so what I basically did is I looked through all of the the law in the background that was available to me, and basically I couldn't find anything that I really wanted to hook off. I did find something, uh, but then one of the things that the video game developer said, yeah, we are putting new systems into the game. If you want a brand new system uh, to put your story in. In the video game, because that basically this video game, video game simulates the entire galaxy of the Milky Way, right? Uh, if you, and, you know, and there's, there's there's plenty of stars to go around. There's about 400 billion of them. Okay, so the stars aren't in short supply. Um, they basically said you can have your own system. So I thought, oh, well, that sounds great. Okay, I'll tell you what. I'll, can I? Then I started negotiating. Can I have more than one? They went, mm, um, yeah, kind of. Um, so basically, I was allowed to design my own solar system which you know, isn't something that happens very often. So I was able to design my own solar system and I was able to name a couple of other um, systems nearby which I could use as sort of you know, places where other stuff happened. Okay, so basically the setup therefore was in this system, it's, the system is located in between two superpowers. Okay? Now these superpowers are trying not to fight each other really, really hard okay? um, because they don't want an all-out war because it's too expensive. Um, so what they do is they, they do what nations on Earth do today. They have little proxy wars between other organizations who they sort of sponsor. OK, that's how it that's how it's done. Um, now, this particular moon turns out to have something on it which is really, really valuable. OK, it's a, it's a metal called tantalum. Um, and um, MacGuffin time, um, tantalum is really, really handy for making hyperdrives. OK, <laughs> because it is. All right. <laughs> um, so suddenly there's a new hyperdrive technology that has been invented just as the story is opening uh, and as a result tantalum is in is in um, is in huge demand okay so this moon suddenly overnight becomes a massive strategic point between the two superpowers uh, and as a result they're vying over it okay um, and uh, basically there's 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 claim and counterclaim over this moon and basically who owns it. Uh, it's, no, it's not unobtainium, it's actually a genuinely real thing. Tantalum is actually a real thing. Um, it's, a, it's a metal of some kind. I've got no idea what it's really useful for, but in the future, it's gonna be jolly useful for hyperdrives, okay? Um, so, um, and as you can see in here, I've written down basically the, this is what happens before the story starts, okay? Basically, so there's tension between uh, the Imperials and the um, yeah the federation okay now <laughs> this is not the most imaginative setup okay so there's on one side we've got the imperials and on the other side we've got the federation um, uh, but that's that is the that is the gate that that's that's the law from the game world there's nothing there's nothing I can do about it so it's it's a bit it's a bit twee and it's a bit kind of obvious but um, you've got the imperials on one side um, and you've got the federation on the other now. Um, there is, a, there is a third faction, but they don't really come into my story, but you know, just for completeness, they are. Um, so uh, that's, that's, the, that's the backstory, okay? There's political tension. It's a political kind of a story, at least the backdrop is it, uh, between the two sort of things. Uh, and then I've basically written in a few dates, explains what happens and um, uh, you know, what's going on. Yeah, so you know, 
pitch stuff from Blake 7, why not? So um, the only thing that this does have going for it, actually, over things like Blake 7, is that the Imperials and the Federation, neither of them are really the baddies. They're both just flavours of bad, okay? <laughs> so um, as it was described to me, the Imperials are, in this case, yeah, they're, they're not like the Star Wars Imperials, i.e. they're you know, just an oppressive kind of Nazi-ish kind of evil empire. Um, they're just, they're, they are an empire, but they're, um, they're, they're just sort of, um, well, they were, they were described to me as kind of like the Roman Republic crossed with the British Empire in space. Okay, and that, that's how they were described to me initially. Um, so, so elite Imperials, yeah, they're kind of just British. <laughs> So imagine the British Empire, but in space. Okay, that's kind of what the Imperials are like. And the Federation is kind of like the United States on steroids. Um, you know, capitalism gone utterly crazy in space. Okay, so that, that's, that gives you a flavour of the two main superpowers uh, that, that are kind of going on. So, but work out what happened, what, what's, what's, the, what's the setup? What happens just before the story starts? Okay. That's 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 the one thing I did there. So I wrote a fair section there, basically just to say, okay, you know, on the edge of Imperial and Federation territory lies a star system known to traders as Prism. Okay, now that's actually what's quite cool about this is even now today you can go into this video game, and if you know how to move around and you've got a spaceship and stuff, you can go and visit some of these places, which is which is quite a cool thing. Um, uh, and then a little bit of structure, basically. So tantalum becomes a precious commodity. This moon has lots of tantalum. The Federation and the Empire go, oh, we want that ready to go conflict okay so but the conflict hasn't started at the point you know the, the, yeah the backstory um then once i've done that i changed tack a little bit okay before i started developing the plot i thought well who do i who do i want to be talking this story about because i had asked the video game company here who's writing what in the universe and a lot of people said well some people are focusing on a single system some people are doing historical novels. A couple of people are doing funny novels, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, okay, so what topics are they covering? And one of them was copying the, you know, one of them's covering the aliens. One's doing, um, you know, some Federation stuff. Some are doing it from the perspective of piracy. And I said, is anybody doing the Imperials? Um, and the answer was no, no, nobody's asked to do the Imperials. I said, can I do the Imperials then? Because they, they, they sounded more interesting to me. And obviously I was British, so. Uh, as were most of the other writers, I think. But um, I, I said, yeah, they said, yeah, it's absolutely fine. You go do the Imperials. Um, so um, uh, so uh, I, I focused on the Imperials. Okay, so what kind of story do I, what, what are these Imperials like? And then I got into the characters, okay? Now, for the type of writing that I do, I am a character, what, what's called a character-driven writer, okay? Um, I, the characters are the most important part of the story to me. What, how do they start out? What happens to them? What kind of person are they? What sort of process do they go through? What sort of decisions do they have to make? And where do they end up? Okay, you know, I like writing the, the, you know, the, the character interactions, the arguments, the kind of, um, you know, the, um, the stupidness that people do, the, you know, the, um, you know, the, all, all the dynamics of, of bringing characters together and making them interact with each other. That, that's the bit I like doing. So, you know, what, what, what sort of characters that I had in mind? I had one character in mind uh, fairly early on. And um, so what I, what I started doing in my plan, as you can see over here, is who are the major characters and what do they do and what do they like? Um, now, I'm also quite a visual person. So what I, what I do tend to do, and <laughs> um, other writers will be, will be familiar with it, um, is I, I try and find images um, of the things that I want to write about. Um, so, I mean, actually, if I could quickly jump to my appendix here. So, um, when I was starting to write, what does this, what, what does the world feel like? Because, you know, we were writing this book before the video game came out. So there was no video game. All we had is a few kind of, it looked roughly like this, kind of diagrams, really. There was no, nothing specific at all. So I used different tools to do some CGI for me. Okay, well, what does a, you know, what does a, what does a planet with multiple stars kind of look like? And this is, this is what I came up with. Um, so this stuff is all there. This is early sort of CGI stuff. Um, um, I wanted a... Um, a pair of planets, one of which was inhabitable, one of which was just a kind of water world, 
Um, I wanted somewhere where eclipses could happen. I wanted some barren planets with craters on. I you know, wanted stuff like this. Um, so all this stuff was stuff that I kind of generated to kind of give me a feel of the sort of environment I was writing in. And I kept all the pictures. So when I designed the solar system, which sounds a bit grandiose, I did actually design it. Um, so initially I had a, a little map somewhere. Where's the star map? Here we go. Not that one. Uh, uh, and there we go. I had a, I, I, there's my <laughs> there is my design for a solar system. Okay, um, so there's the prism star. There are in fact four stars in the system, and um, I designed the solar system. You know, in terms of where the planets were and what orbits. Okay, um, and you know what they were called, uh, and all those kind of things. So you know that's how I designed it. Um, because I was a, you know, a bit of a geek, and I was actually working for people who were, were super geeks, you know, I even put in you know, the, the correct um, astronomical naming conventions for things, which is probably a bit overkill, but I enjoyed doing it, um, and the description of the plants. Now, this, this system, as I designed it, does exist still in the game, which is, which is quite a cool thing. They did actually put it in exactly as I kind of wanted it, apart from they got this planet wrong. Um, it's not a water world in the game for some strange reason. It's a high metal content planet or something. They got it, they got it right. Um, but you know, you are god of your universe. You're quite right. Um, so um, so you know, so I, I did all that and I, I designed the planet and then I went down and I, I worked out some imagery. So when I'm in my when I'm writing and I'm in my head and we're flying a spaceship, uh, you know, across the Keone Moon as it is in this case. Uh, with Daedalian in the background, which is the name of the, the far planet, that I can kind of visualise what it looks like. That was that was the point to me, is trying to, to trying to do those things. What, what's what's the feel of actually being in this in this universe, and what does it feel like? Because there was there was nothing else to work on at the time, um, so that's how I basically did. It. The same thing is happens with characters. Okay, so as I started looking at the characters, so. I started looking for imagery that kind of made me feel, yeah, that's the sort of person I'm dealing with. Okay, now the <laughs> writers will know this. I mentioned this just a moment ago. Writers will know, um, yeah, be very careful when you're looking for a writer's search history. Okay, because because you'll find things like angry woman with stick, <laughs> or or strange man half undressed with machine gun. You know, you'll. you'll <laughs> You'll find things like this, okay? Because you're, you've got an idea in your head of the sort of thing that you want to visually use. And <laughs> you're trying to search for images that help with that, okay? Um, so I can't remember what I searched to get this particular image here, but and I've no idea who this lady is, actually. She's, you know, some actress, uh, some, you know, some model, I'm guessing. I've, I've no idea. And I've seen her image come up a few times in, in sorts of different things because obviously some other people had the same. But it, it struck me as this is the sort of look that I wanted for my primary character. Um, and so this, you know, for, for those of you who've read this, uh, you know, this is this is uh, Lady Kahina Tajani Loren, which was a bit of a mouthful, but, um, you know, there was a reason for the naming, uh, who, who later becomes known as Salome in the story. Um, and so she's basically, oh, you know, what I wanted here is I didn't want, I didn't want to rescue the princess story. Okay, um, there's been, you know, in science fiction, there's way too many rescue the princess stories. I didn't want this woman to be um, a character who had to be bailed out of trouble by a bloke. Okay, yeah, because that's that's very, very, that's very, 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 very cliche by this point. I also didn't want her to be a sort of macho kind of. Um, you know, can beat the boys at their own game sort of um, kind of heroine either. You know, that, that she's so good at what she does that everyone just goes, wow, she's awesome. You know, I didn't want her to be that kind of person either. What I wanted to her to be a, a flawed character that actually you weren't sure if you were rooting for her or not through most of the story. Um, and so I worked quite hard to develop that. Um, House of uh, Apathy says, I have a question, how do you personally go about determining how many significant major characters there are in your book, seeing that character is the most important? I must assume that these also drive the major conflicts that help tell a story. This is perhaps a bit early to ask this question, as you might cover it there. That's a good question. I will come back to that one, um, if that's all right. But um, it's, it's a very good question. Um, so, um, so I start by developing what kind of person is she? So I start with a profile, okay? so. I'm going to give her a bit of an insecurity complex. Okay, so she's the youngest daughter of three. Okay, um, so she's got two older older sisters, um, and her father is 
a senator and he's the leader of the family. So her father's quite a long way up in the echelon of the empire. She's a daughter. She's the third daughter. Um, she isn't the prettiest daughter either. Okay, so the, her two older sisters are a bit more, you know, pleasing on the eye, shall we say. Um, and so, but she is the smartest one. Okay, so she's very good at um, causing arguments and then not getting caught for causing arguments, if that makes sense. So, you know, she's also aware that because she's the daughter of a senator, she knows that she is going to be um, married off for political advantage to somebody that she probably won't care about very much. Um, and she doesn't like that. She says, you know, I feel like I'm cut out for better things. So it is a little bit kind of a cinderella type thing going on there. Um, that is fair. So, but she's a very <laughs> unpleasant Cinderella, okay? So she's not kind of just like, oh, woe is me. Wouldn't it be nice if Prince Charming could come over? You know, she's kind of basically, <laughs> she's, she's basically, I don't, you know, life is being unfair to me. I know I'm stuck in this, you know, these trappings of luxury. I've got un unlimited money, but I have no freedom. I have no life. Um, so she's aggressive. She's sharp tongued. She's manipulative. She's got a cutting wit. Um, and her father doesn't like her because she's troublesome and she's always upsetting his plans. Um, and um, But she has um, kept an eye on what's going on in the wider empire and arranged to be taught by somebody who knows a little bit more than what's going on. Because she is smart and she is intelligent. And she keeps that all quite well hidden. But she's ultimately quite a frustrated individual. Okay, um, So she's, she's a sort of person who... Um, you might respect, but you probably don't like. Okay, I <laughs> certainly wouldn't want to admit her myself. Um, and then the character developed a bit beyond that. Okay, so I thought, okay, so I want a character that's not cookie cutter. It's not a rescue the princess story. It isn't the, you know, it's it's not the, the tough, you know, hard kick-ass woman defeats everybody, you know, at ease story either. I want her to be somebody who makes mistakes, gets things wrong, gets into trouble, uh, maybe finds herself, you know, finds her way out of herself sometimes, but also sometimes needs help as well and comes to realization, you know, that, you know, actually being mean to everybody isn't necessarily the way forward. Um, you know, so she's, she's designed to be a character that's not cookie cutter, okay, not a cookie cutter. Um, then there are other characters, okay, so, you know, this guy um, is basically, um, you know, a kind of mean, moody individual. He's, a, he's, a, he's an ex military type. Um, he is playing multiple personas throughout the story, so he, you, you don't know what side he's on, you don't know who he's actually working for, because he claims to be working for one side, and then shows up working for the other guys, um, you know, at different points in the story. Um, so that's, you know, so all those sort of things, you know, how does he come across? Um, he's, he's very politically aware, he knows what's going on. Um, he's he's basically identified Kahina as a sort of kindred spirit, but he knows he can use her ability to his advantage. So he's got an agenda. Da 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 da. Okay, uh, all sorts of stuff going on there. Um, Hassan is another character. So I'm um, you know again. Um, uh, this guy is kind of young. He's naive. He's got the visions of being a you know. He just wants money. He just wants to be rich. He just wants to be powerful. He wants to be respected. Um, he thinks the way to do that is to sort of con and cheat his way through a, a series of ship deals and make lots and lots of money. And um, of course, it doesn't quite all go to plan. Um, and he gets into loads and loads of trouble, gets in over his head, basically, trying to do, you know, do deals to, to kind of get money. That all goes wrong. Uh, so that's him. And then this lady, this is, this is one of my favourite characters, actually. This was um, Octavia Quinton. Now, she's... <laughs> She's basically an old, an aging woman. Okay, she's an aging woman who's slightly cybernetic in the, in the story, um, and she is wrestling with her age and her loss of youth, and she basically wants it back. And she's found a way to do it, uh, and she's obsessed with it. And she's not going to let anybody stand in her way. She has huge resources, huge money. Uh, she has the ability to basically snap her fingers and make things happen apart from this one issue that she's dealing with, which is her advancing years. Um, and the, the solution to that for her is very, very complicated, but it can be done if everything works out. And that's what she's trying to do. So all those sort of these are the sort of characters that I came in for. And I, you know, there's other ones as a, you know, a, a happy go lucky trader who clearly knows more than that he's revealing. Um, and then I get into some of the minor characters. So I suppose, how many major characters did I have here? So I've had 
what I've basically got here, and this is kind of going back to that, that, that question that um, was asked earlier, how many, ma ma how many major characters do you need? Well, this is an averagely complicated story, I would say, and I've got five major characters. Um, but I have a supporting cast of 15 smaller, you know, smaller character parts. Uh, these ones didn't warrant a, um, you know, a picture. I didn't, I didn't feel I needed them because we weren't focusing on them for long enough. Uh, in the story, but they've all got little individual mannerisms. Okay, so we've got Commissioner Tenem Nesaver here. Um, you know, key mannerisms. He's fond of a wry grin, but very much aware of how to mislead people with body language. It's impossible to tell precisely what his plans are. Okay, so <laughs> he's a slippery politician, basically. Um, Jenu Merrington here. Jenu is a sense of mischievous about her in a shop, which you can deploy when appropriate. Okay, so she's smart and canny, but she's kind of an aide to Tenem. That's where she she kind of um, plugs into that. Um, uh, this was another favourite character, Ambassador Cuthric. Um, he's polite to a fault. I basically um, based Cuthric off my grandfather, who would never ever say a rude word, um, never get riled, never get upset, always very, very calm and collected, but could just cut through an argument with a well chosen word as, as and when he needed to. Uh, he maintains nine control in his external perception. His diction is precise, refined and measured, but he can be absolutely brutal when needs be, but he's always very, very softly spoken. Okay, so that, yeah. Trying to make the characters distinct. This was, um, this, this was, um, this was very much something that I spent a lot of time on. Okay, so um, Tenim, Gre think greasy politician, okay? Jenu has associated herself with Tenim because she sees the money and she sees the success, but she'll pull out and leave the moment everything's going south. Um, Cuthric is your classic, um, I've, I've described, uh, you know, um, I've, descri I've described him here. Cuthric is a tall and elegant fellow with an immaculately trimmed grey hair. Think of a perfectly groomed wizard, okay? <laughs> So that's how I've described him to myself. He dresses in the dignified manner, yet always in line with changeable and period fashion. So he's got a pulse on what's going on, but he's he's, a, he's just immaculate. He's the perfect gentleman at all times. That's what he looks like. Patron Zaire is thin and frail and worried about his position in society. Patron Guerin is huge and obese. Okay, he's a massive guy with blob of a man. Uh, and so on and so forth. Trying to make each character distinctive. That's the important thing, okay? Yeah, we should be able to when reading, go, oh, that's so-and-so, okay? Because um, Patron Guerin sort of talks like this. He said, well, of course, we should uh, we should probably stop for some lunch soon, don't you think? Yeah, I think we should. I think that's how Patron Guerin would talk. And whereas Patron Zai is, well, yeah, I, 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 I'm not entirely certain about whether we should be doing this. When's it going to be done? When's it going to be done? You know, that's... <laughs> I'm, I'm over here That's the sort of personality you want to get into your characters, okay, to make them memorable. Memorable. Whereas Cuthric, Cuthric would be, yes, well, we will do that now, and in the future, we will make sure that we don't do that again. You know, it's very measured. Um, and um, you have those sort of things in your head when you're trying to design your, your characters to support, because they're there to get other things to happen. And I did the same thing with, the, obviously, the primary characters, but in a much more... Uh, a much greater depth. So designing these sort of things in there um, to make sure that they, they fit and they, they add something and they're distinctive so that when a character is speaking you kind of know who, who they are and, and what's kind of going on. So that's, I designed that. Now the, the reason I've written it all down is every so often I, I, you know, when I'm writing a story I've got to go, well, how the hell does this guy speak again? What, what, what's his mojo? Um, and because I've worked out what his mojo is, um, you know, and what, he, what, what he's about. I can just go back, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so his view on this particular situation would be that. And just allows me to write it that bit easier. Because, you know, otherwise there's a lot of detail in here. You can't, well, at least I can't, I can't keep it in your head. In, my, in your head? <laughs> I can't keep it in my head. If I could keep it in your head, it would be much, much easier because I could just pull it out as, as a win. But no, it doesn't work like that. Um, you know, so, um, you know, designing that to make sure that that's work. Um, how's everybody? This is the Tenem Janu Cuthric Zaya dynamic is amazing. So I had a lot of fun because I'm playing these people off each other. You know, the Imperials and the Federation want to fight each other, but they don't. Okay, because um, a war would be too costly. All right, 
uh, a war would be too costly. Um, so they, they 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 vie and they politic and they try and undermine each other and they try and get you know things over each other in political situations to try and achieve the things that they want to achieve. And that's that's the tension in the book. Um, are those voices in the audiobook? No, not <laughs> well, kind of. I mean, the the, the audio book was actually narrated by this particular audio book was done by Toby Longworth, who is. Um, Doctor Who, Blake Seven, and Star Wars fame actually. So it was you know, it was a real privilege to have him narrate my audiobook. He does an amazing job, okay, with all the voices to make them all distinct. Um, and he actually said to me, he said it was brilliant having this. He said this. He had. Um, he said it was brilliant having this. So when I, when I basically came to do the voice, he said the fact that you'd written down the kind of person that the voice was, basically said I can I can then do my thing I can act and I become that that character and so if you listen to um, the audiobook of Elite Reclamation Toby Longworth narrated it and he did a different voice for every single character in here he's an amazing guy and um, but he used this document here that you've got on the screen to create the differences in the characters for the audio but based on the descriptions I've written so that's that's kind of how that was done um, so distinct characters are must yeah so what you don't want is your characters to be kind of kind of the same um, you know try and avoid that so at least for me strong characters that are memorable uh, they go oh yeah you remember that politician that was in <laughs> that book that, he was really funny I liked him um, and it's interesting I've you know I've spoken to loads and loads of people and some people you know adore Salome because she's she's kind of well she's kind of an anti-heroine really but um, you know she's different okay she's different and she's 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 worthy of respect if not love um, for, for the things that she does because she does she does some pretty horrible things in the book um, and uh, but other people basically say Luco now he's my favorite because he's he's just because he's Italian okay um, and um, you know an Italian in space. <laughs> He's actually he's actually based on a real life person. Uh, this guy, um, and you know, this is another one of those. You know, it's a bit of a cliche, but write what you know. Okay, it's and write what you know mustn't be taken into too much depth. Okay, uh, I prefer based on some of your own life experiences, which isn't quite as snappy as write what you know, but it's a little bit more true to form. Um, uh, I came up. This this name sounds a bit grandiose, but it's actually a real name. Uh, Luciano Prestigio Giovanni is, or at least was. I, so I hope the, the chap's still alive. Um, is is a is a ta is or was a taxi driver in in Rome. Okay, <laughs> and this is this is this is a story I have told before. But basically, I was um, uh, I had to get from Rome, center of Rome, to Fumicino Airport back in 1990 something. Um, and uh, we were late coming out of our meeting you know, the, the meeting had ever run the, the plane was i don't know going to go in about 40 minutes this was the days long before 9 11 uh when airport security was we're british let us through you know <laughs> which was great um and um you know and those 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 halcyon days long gone and uh, anyway um yeah basically it was it was rush hour in rome and anyone has everyone been to rome in russia will know what, what that's like uh, and we had 40 minutes to get to the airport, which was normally about a 45 minute drive away under normal conditions. So it was an impossibility in traffic. Um, anyway, <laughs> our host summoned this taxi driver. And he turns up in some ancient, I don't know what it was, a Renault something. Um, you know, not a, not, a, not a fast supercar, it was just an ordinary saloon car. Um, we all bundle in the back and he doesn't speak any English. Um, you know, we're, we're sort of saying, eh, puerto, eh, puerto. I don't know. <laughs> I think I was Spanish, actually. But anyway, uh, he kind of got what we meant. And then our host basically jabbed at him in, in Italian at very, very high speed. And basically, uh, uh, the, the translation of that was something like, you've got to get these guys to the airport. You know, it's, 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 it's basically, you know, life or death. OK. Um, so anyway, um, I just saw, I just remember very distinctly, OK, this guy, basically, he just sort of flexed his fingers like this. Click, grab the steering wheel, put the car into first <laughs> and just sort of look on his face was this is the day I was born for <laughs> basically nails the throttle brings up the clutch there's this wheel spin there's spoke <laughs> the tire stops spinning and we're off okay and he's driving through that traffic <laughs> round the roundabouts the wrong way and we were going oh my god ah! It wasn't time to get the seatbelts on. And you know, on the old seatbelts, the inertia locking mechanism, when you're when you're trying to <laughs> trying to get the seatbelt and it's jammed because of the, because of the fact that you're pulling it. Okay, 
just like that. I was trying to get the seatbelt on, but it was jammed, and I couldn't put it. I was like, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. And it was basically, we were either going to be dead, or we were going to go <laughs> get to the airport on time. Anyway, he doesn't get there, okay. I think I did eventually manage to get the seatbelt on. Um, but we, we screamed into the, you know, the, the arrival section of the uh, the airport. And, uh, you know, basically we were like trying to get all our bags out and basically say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Here's your money, basically, he says. And it says, ah, it says, it was a pleasure. You remember, you remember Luciano Prestigio Giovanni. <laughs> then he was gone. <laughs> and it's just, I just remember this guy. But, yeah, it's like, and I thought, <laughs> one day I'm going to put him in a book. That's him. <laughs> um, so that's that's the that's the uh, that's the story behind Luciano Prestigio Giovanni, um, and I you know so I just borrowed it because what a, what a guy. Um, um, so so there we go. Um, <laughs> but yeah, if you can, don't write what you know, but take something that's happened to you and transpose it into a story. Yeah, that's what I think. Write what you know actually really means because. I can't write what I know in terms of a space story set a thousand years in the future, can I? Because nobody's ever been there, right? Um, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if somebody else hasn't always... Yes, maybe he's, maybe he's been immortalised somewhere else. I hope he's still alive. <laughs> All that kind of driving. Uh, but that's characterisation, OK? So what I've done here in my plan is I've gone through the characters, I've made sure that they're padded out to make sure that they're interesting, a little bit different, um, that they're quite distinct, that I can basically say, okay, yes, Aluccio would do that, Salome would do this, uh, Hassan would do that, etc, etc, etc. Anybody I find useful, basically, my, my rule of thumb is, if the character deserves a name, right, <laughs> in your book, it's not just the attendant or the, you know, the pilot, okay, if they're, if they're that, then if they're not important enough to deserve a name, then I wouldn't personally spend much time on them. But if they're important enough that you have to refer to them by name, give them a personality, okay, and write it down. Um, so I have to flag that, go back to Rome and flag down all the tag things. Uh, but it was, you know, I mean, it's, God, it'd be more than 20 years ago now. Hopefully he's retired somewhere nice. <laughs> um, but so but there we go. So, um, yeah, and on that note, uh, in terms of translating to audiobook, the other thing I did is just the pronunciations, okay? Um, so, um, you know, some of these words in here are quite quite difficult. Uh, so, Daedalian, Daedalion, okay? Emphasis on the second syllable. Kioni is an interesting one because most people would pronounce it Chion to start with, um, but it's actually Kioni. That's, it's all based on ancient Greek myth, and there's a reason for that, which is more complicated than this this, this stream can go into. Um, um, this one, yeah, you know, lots of people pronounce this one different way. This was a little nod, actually, to another computer game uh, that some of you all know about. Um, and then Salome, Salome. Uh, you know, there's multiple ways to pronounce Salome. Some people just say Salome. Um, some people say Salome. Um, I prefer Salome with a middle long loo, but that's just me. Um, so that's how I wanted it pronounced, etc. Um, I called it dandelion in my head for simplicity, no shame. <laughs> the dandelion, the dandelion planet. Um, so, so that sort of thing. Now, um, then I basically went through and worked out, yeah, you know, where what's what's going on here. Okay, so there's a bit more background. Um, where is all this happening? Okay, there's my summary of the politics. Okay, where is the actual happening? You know, where's the actual action taking place? Um, what technology do we have? Now, um, in this particular example, a lot of this was worked out in advance for me because uh, the game provides you with you know, space lasers and missiles and hyperspaces and shields and all the usual kind of paraphernalia of spaceships, okay? Um, but it, it did have a few little unusual bits and pieces that differentiated it from your average kind of space sci-fi environment. Um, so one weird thing, to be honest, in the game is that initially there was... There's no anti-gravity, okay? So this is a slightly interesting one. Um, you know, in, in Star Wars, in Star Trek, in almost every space opera fantasy um, that you care to name, there's always some anti-gravity, okay? Uh, so basically, in order to keep production costs low when you film it, <laughs> on TV and film. Um, so basically, people can walk around the decks of the ship uh, without floating around, okay? Um, it, it saves a lot of money for TV and film. Um, but in order to have that in space, which of course 
it, space isn't really like that. Um, you have to magic in some anti-gravity. Okay, so Star Trek has it, Star Wars has it, etc., etc., etc. You know, an awful, you know, probably 80, 90 percent of all the TV shows have had some kind of anti-gravity in. Um, notable shows that haven't are things like, uh, you know, um, um, The Expanse is one particular one where they don't. They stick with the real laws of physics. Um, and um, things like 2001, The Space Odyssey is a film which was, you know, much, much more realistic. OK, uh, but uh, this particular game stuck with. Um, no anti-gravity, okay? So it's something to bear in mind when you're writing the book. Um, communications were done by what are called hollow fact systems. So you imagine the sort of freestanding holograms that you have in lots and lots of TV shows. Nothing particularly unusual about that. Um, but there is a differentiation between the types of technology. So in the core world, which were kind of the central part where everything is shiny and advanced, people had laser guns and you know, all sorts of interesting uh, weapons. The further out you go, the more primitive things come. So on the outlying systems, people were still using traditional handguns with projectiles. Okay, So there was a technological kind of slide down into um, you know, less, less, um, uh, less, you know, less modern technology, if that makes sense. Uh, there's a bit of piracy um, and so on and so forth. What are people like? Well, the Imperials are posh, they're British in space. Uh, the fanboyant clothes, it's all about appearances, it's about who you know and not what you know, etc, etc, etc. They they still have slavery, okay, so that's an interesting one. Um, um, yeah, the, the Empire does allow slavery. Interesting, you know, that's different to modern society. Um, and so on and so forth. So then I've already talked about designing the solar system. Um, and then you know, what else is there that's interesting? Well, there's a few other star systems that are important. Um, there's a spaceport, there's a uh, yeah, particular oil, you know, there's a refinery, which becomes an important part of the story. Um, and then there was a piece of text, uh, which I asked to be inserted into the game so that it would match what was written in the book. And I I think I'm right in saying that's probably still there, but uh, it may have been updated since. Um, and so, you know, just to make sure that anybody playing the game would go, oh, hey, yeah, yeah, that system, okay, um, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so uh, there's also, um, yeah, this was this was actually top secret at the time, okay, uh, it isn't now, obviously, because it's kind of been outed, but um, there was a system there called LP933-24. Um, which is where um, Octavia Quinton's smuggling hideout was supposed to be, okay, a dark system. Um, as I put here, presumably rather difficult to find unless you already know where it is. It's, it's sort of a, you know, kind of a pirate cove, basically. Um, and that was in this particular system. So it allowed you know, people playing the video game to go and visit particular locales associated with the book, which is, which is quite a cool thing to be able to do. Um, and then um, this one was interesting. There was no, you know, so basically I'm trying to figure out where is everything in space, okay, for the purposes of storytelling. Like how long does it get to get, how long does it take to get to places? Um, you know, because you kind of have to have, sometimes you have to have that kickback time in the novel, okay? So there's, there's times when everything is action, it's space, combat, laser beam, pew pew, etc. But there are other times when the ship is in transit from one place to another, and then things are a bit calmer, and the, and the characters have a chance to reflect and go, yeah, you know, remember the battle of XYZ, or, you know, so where have you come from? You know, what are you doing on the ship? Yeah, you know, they have the chance to have a bit more of a relaxed conversation, maybe grab a coffee or a bite to eat and just chill out a little bit while they're doing the transit. Um, and in this game, that's done using hyperspace, okay? So it takes a certain amount of time to get to different places. Um, and you have to keep jumping in order to, to do those sort of things. Um, now, in order to kind of, okay, well, is this a long journey or is it a short journey? And we really didn't know at this point in time. And when I said, is there a map of all the stars? I was basically told, no, we're working on it. So um, I said, if I make my own map and, you know, in order to write the novel, could you sort of manage to put it into the game roughly like the way I'm doing it? And they kind of went, mm, maybe, we'll see. Okay, so show us what you've got. So basically, I did something very, very simple. Um, so basically... This is, this is I th and I think this is one of the, in the game there's this concept called the bubble, and I think this is one of the origins of that phrase, because I basically called this the bubble long before the bubble <laughs> became a thing in the game. Um, and I basically said, well, it's a bubble centered on soul, right? It's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's obviously not just a circle, it would be a sphere, but for the sake of simplicity, um, 
it's this is this is explored space. Okay, so within a certain radius of Sol, uh, I'd said a hundred light years. It was a guess. It's quite a lot more than that. Um, this is explored space. Anything beyond that is the frontier. It's kind of like unexplored space. We don't know what's out there. Um, so Sol and Akinara, that you know, Sol is the headquarters of the uh, uh, of the Federation, uh, and Akinara is the is the headquarters of the Empire. And then the prism system is quite a long way out. At least it was originally quite a long way out. Okay, um, and it's kind of in contention between the two. And that's this is basically how the um, you know how the how, the, how the, the the politics of the story plays out. So there's an imperial world here, which is a proxy world, which is quite close to Prism, striking distance basically of Prism. And there's a there's a Federation world here, it's also in striking distance of Prism, and therefore we can deploy ships and try and take over the place and blockade it and things like that. Okay, so that's basically how it was written. And you, as you can see up here, without a current star map, it's not possible for these positions to be plotted. But based on previous games and the way the plots worked out, um, this is how how it's done. So this is, again, this is all the background, right? This is all the background. And eventually we get to the actual <laughs> the actual story. Okay, um, there's a few other bits and pieces in here. Uh, what do we need? Um, um, do I need any additions to the official timeline? Okay, so there was an official timeline for the video game by this point. I basically said, can I have three things happen in the timeline? Uh, one in the year 3225, one in the year 3260, and the other one in 3297. And those were added into the official timeline, if you like. Then I also uh, said, these are the ships I would like to have. Uh, yeah, people who know this video game will basically spot that's interesting enough here because there are ships in here um, that aren't mentioned because they didn't exist at the time. So this really was, uh, what I tried to do is give a place to all of the ships that we did know were going to be in the game prior to launch. Okay, so there's something called an Imperial Cutter, which is like kind of a big ship. Sidewinders and Asps are sort of pirate vessels. Uh, Dolk's uh, attack ship was an Asp as well. Uh, there was an Old Eagle in there. Uh, there was an Anaconda, which was like a, at the time, quite a heavy military ship. Uh, there was a Cobra, which is kind of the quintessential ship of the game. They're all named after snakes, or at least most of them are. Um, uh, dolphin yachts and freighters are seen. There's a vulture who's flown by an assassin. Um, Federation and Imperial forces have battleships. Um, those were later retconned a little bit down to the um, the, the big ships you see in the game. Um, there's an adder uh, and there's an Imperial courier uh, as well. So and those were, that was it. Okay. Um, so um, no, there wasn't a the python actually. That's a good point. I can't remember. Did the python come along? There was a python there from day one. I can't remember now. Maybe it was. Maybe I missed it out. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe I just didn't like the python. I don't know. Um, so so that's it. So yeah, all the background, all the location, the star map, the locales. Now, if you're not into science fiction, translate some of these. Okay, so you know maybe the different types. If you're in a fantasy novel, let's say, what um, you know what countries exist, what regions, what kingdoms exist. Um, character stuff is still the same. Um, how do we get from one place to another? Okay, you're not using a hyperdrive, but are you using are you using magic? Are you using a horse? Are you using horse and cart? How do you, you know, are you just walking? All of those sort of places, um, yeah, those mechanisms, it's the same sort of planning that you need to think about doing. Um, and then, um, you, know, you know, maybe the ships, well, okay, you're not gonna have starships, but you might have um, cities, you might have, um, you know, naval ships, all those sort of things, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then eventually I get down to the plot, okay? So what I do here is, this is exactly what happens in the novel. Um, all detail revealed, okay? So this is super spoiler territory. Now you wouldn't want to hand this document out to anybody who hadn't read your novel yet, okay? Because this basically tells them exactly what's going on. Okay, um, it doesn't, the, when I do the detailed plot, it, it's telling me, the writer, what I'm doing. Okay, so for example here, okay, here's, this is basically chapter two. Dolk and the other patrons, realizing the current situation is untenable, put together a plan to allow the system to collapse in a controlled fashion and frustrate the ambitions of the Federation so they may benefit from the outcome. Okay, they intend to bring Algreb's youngest daughter, Kahina, 
who we've already been introduced to, into a position of power and then control the system through her as a puppet ruler. Okay, so Dolk has been grooming Kahina with this goal in mind, um, and at this point, Kahina trusts him completely. She is not enthusiastic about being a senator. Okay, so what the, what's basically happening here is that the political situation has become unstable. They've decided that the senator in charge of the family is no longer fit for purpose, and so what they what they're going to do is they're going to get the rebels. They're going to support the rebels behind the scenes to assassinate the guy who's actually their boss so that they can replace him with his daughter and they can control the politics through her. That's basically their gambit. Now, I've written that out in longhand here okay, to tell me, the writer, what I'm doing. But when I'm writing it, clearly I don't want you, the reader, to know that at this point in time. Okay, because you know, it needs to come out much later. What do you mean you were grooming me for this task? Are you lying? Yeah, et cetera. Okay. Okay, so you as the reader wouldn't know this at this point in the story. This is entirely for my benefit, so I know what's going on. Okay. However, dun, 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 unknown to the other patrons, Doc has his own agenda. Actually, he is playing the part of one of the original rebels. Okay. Uh, so he's basically trying to undermine the political structure by help well, by working with the political structure in order to bring the political structure down in what appears to be a chaotic way then he's actually going to get rid of Kahina herself so he can basically take over the place okay that's his gambit okay so there's a layer an extra layer on top of the layer that's already there um, of course the best laid plans of mice and men it all starts to go wrong for everybody okay so the rebels find that um, they basically they botch the assassination of the um, uh, the the senator. Um, as it turns out, uh, Kahina herself uh, is also killed <laughs> because, because basically Dolk has to think on his feet and say, "Okay, I need Kahina to be alive in order to take over the politics of this plan because I can't pick it up myself. What I need her to do is I need her to be in power, so then she will then cede power to me." Formally, so I need her to be alive, but basically the reclamists have taken over the city much more effectively than I expected them to and they're about to kill her So what does he do? He kills her himself <laughs> Okay, but he kills her. it doesn't he doesn't shoot her with a gun and hack her body to death He basically gives her an honorable death on the end of a sword. Okay um, And so Kahina dies. Okay in chapter 3. I think it is chapter 3 or 4 Okay um, but because she is has been only stabbed by a sword, what is a what Dolk is able to do is basically summon up his sort of plan B, which is basically um, grab her body before it's you know beyond medical science's ability to restore and have her stored. Okay, so he basically puts her in a pod and then evacuates the pod off the planet, basically with the intent of effectively resuscitating her. Um, now that process is 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 going okay until. <laughs> Somebody else swoops and goes, ah, here looks like a, a juicy cargo for me to pinch. And um, basically intercepts Dolk's ship while it's carrying Kahina's body and basically pinches the cargo. Um, now, because Kahina is then woken up halfway through the restoration process, her body is fixed from the injuries, but her memory has been affected by, by the process that she, she's gone through. She can't remember who she is. Okay, and then the story keeps going on and on and on from there. Um, so all of those little plot points I've gone through specifically and called out in the plot to make sure it works. Does it make sense that um, Dolk would do that? Yes, it does, because he needs Kehida to be alive so that she can do that thing in the future. Does she do that thing in the future? No, because she figures out what's going on. Um, and then basically double crosses him back, etc., uh, etc. Et and so I've gone through all the plot holes that I'm trying to work through because it's quite a complicated, twisty plot. And does it make sense on the way through? Does it make sense that Hassan would risk everything to pinch that cargo? Basically, yes, because he hasn't got any money. He's trying to make the big score. Does it make sense that Dolk would allow Kahina to go away unsupervised? Yes, it does, because he has to stay back on the planet to make sure that the reclubists don't cause any further you know, you know, damage to the planet, he's trying to actually take over. So at every stage I've been analysing, does the plot make sense? Um, and by writing it down in longhand, not in a dramatised fashion, 
but in a very straightforward, this happens, this happens, he's trying to deceive these guys, this is what he's actually trying to do, etc, etc, etc. That's the way I've planned the plot. So the plot, as you can see, to Elite Reclamation is one, two, three, four, five, six, six pages long. There we go. That, uh, so six pages of A4 is the specifics of what happens in the plot. Um, do I have any super secret beat uh, reader check to your plot with spoilers? No, so I don't, I don't get anybody to check my plot. I do it myself. I just read it again and again and again and keep asking myself, does it make sense that that character would do that at this point in the story? What's their motivation for doing it? Isn't there a better way to achieve what they're trying to achieve? And if I can think of a better way, then I'll change it. If I think ah, it's just too contrived that that character would be there at that point in the story, it's just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm shoveling them in to make, make the plot work. Then I go and rewrite it again. Okay. So um, I, at every stage I'm going, does it make sense for that character to do what they're doing? It's, I, I don't want it to just be a plot device. I don't want it to just be a coincidence. Oh, look, so-and-so's turned up with a, with a, with a MacGuffin. You know, I don't want that. Okay. I want there to be, you know, each character is trying to do what they think best at each stage of the story. And it makes logical sense for them to be doing that because they have a motivation. They're trying to achieve something. And the way that they think that can best achieve their aim is to do the thing that they're doing in the story. If it passes that test at all stages through the story, then I'm OK with it. If I get to a point where I go and think, no, oh, this character, why are they doing that? That doesn't really make any sense. The only reason they're doing that is for me to be able to get the plot to go to a particular point. That isn't good enough for my own personal quality detail. OK, I won't accept it. I basically say, no, that's just I get really annoyed with it. OK, <laughs> OK, um, <laughs> I get quite frustrated. I'll throw my hands up and go for a walk with the dog or something, trying to resolve it in my head. And it sometimes can take me days or even weeks to resolve a plot conundrum and I won't let it drop. I'm very, very, very OCD about these sort of things. Um, I don't like plot holes. I hate plot holes, OK? Um, only when I've got the plot working to a point where I'm saying, yes, that makes logical sense from all the characters, from all the perspectives, at all of the times, do I go, yes, OK, I'm happy to write that now. Um, uh, so it seems like you'd want the same beta readers to read subsequent editions, or at least some of the of voice novels. So, yeah, so if... Um, my the, fir the first time other readers get hold of it is basically when I've done an editing um, pass on my actual written book. So I don't let anybody read the work in progress stuff. Um, I sign off in my head, if you like, the plot to myself. I satisfy myself that the plot works and then I write the story because this is where the creativity comes in. OK, so this is, um, um, you know, a, a very simple one here. Um, Luco gives Salome medical aid, clothing and food. OK, now that's an entire chapter in um, um, in the book. And I basically, you know, I've added a bit of humor in there in that section. OK, so basically Salome is, you know, she's bedraggled. She's been kicked. She's been beaten. She's half starved to death. She's thirsty. And, um, you know, so Luco gives her some, <laughs> some really posh food. He says, oh, would you like this? Perhaps a glass of wine. You know, and she's, well, you are an imperial. Yeah, I can't give you just the ordinary stuff. So I can inject bits of humour and have some fun with the story when when there's there's no need to be anything too specific. The, the, this, the plot here is basically the fundamentals of the story, OK? There's lots more that gets added in, you know, the character interactions, the way that people argue, the way that things are described, the look and feel of the planets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, OK? Um, but, um, 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 you know, you improvise around the plot. That's where, the, for me, the creativity comes in. Because at this stage, I've written no dialogue. I've written no humour. I've written no... Um, you know, personality into anything. It's just, this is what happens. This is what the characters do. This is how they resolve the problem. This is who's on whose side. Who, this is who's got an agenda, who hasn't got an agenda. It's just, it's just the bare bones of the story, okay? The creativity, the dialogue, all the fun comes once I've got that bit sorted out, if that makes sense. Um, Horn to Love, even the pants that probably has a basic plot in their head as they write, they'll be asking themselves, about what's going on makes sense given what they think will happen later. Now, I, yeah, so I don't disagree with that. What I what I feel is potentially difficult for a panster is it's there's there's this concept of writing yourself into a corner, and I find that if I don't have a plan, 
it's very, very easy to do that, i.e., you know, you write yourself something that's a really, really good scene and it all happens and you get to a point in the story where you go, ha, oh, I can't do that now because they already know that from chapter three or they've already been there from chapter three. So why, why don't they know uh, that thing? Or, you know, they need to get out of somewhere uh, quickly and then suddenly, oh, this ship's got a hyperdrive. Oh, oh, that's that's great. Let's use the hyperdrive. And then your reader might be thinking, hang on a minute, they got stuck in chapter two. Um, why didn't they use the hyperdrive then? You know, so you can have those inconsistencies uh, that creep in. Now, a, a good writer will avoid those, obviously. But I'm not a good enough writer to do that when I'm panstering. Okay, I can't do it. So I have to work it out in advance and go, okay, so if there isn't a hyperdrive available in chapter two, then I can't use a hyperdrive in chapter seven because they haven't got one. Okay, if there is a hyperdrive in chapter seven, they have to have the hyperdrive in chapter two. Um, unless they've acquired it specifically along the way as part of an intermediate chapter. So it's that sort of integrity, that sort of consistency, which is really, really important. Um, so, um, you know, I'm such a plotter, I never get around to the story. Well, that is a balance you have to find. I mean, look how many words this is, okay? This is 9,571 words, and that's not the book. That's just the background story. Um, if you look at my Shadewood one, which I, I won't show you at the moment, but um, the Shadewood one's even bigger, okay, because it covers four books. It's like about 20,000 words of background research. And that one had to contain more because there was no world building done for me. Okay, um, so, you know, this approach may not work for everybody because it's a lot of work before you start the actual work of writing the novel. Uh, but it does show, hopefully, the kind of thought processes that go into creating a novel. Um, I can't, literally, I literally cannot sit down and start writing. Okay, I just can't do it and not come out with something that I'm happy with the quality of. Uh, to me, this level of detail is the minimum I need to do to make my story work from a kind of intellectual um, and you know, integrity perspective. I'm very, very personally, very, very keen on a plot that makes sense that isn't doesn't have MacGuffins in it by you know, and by MacGuffins I mean sort of magic items that turn up and solve particular problems okay you know that yeah which has been lampooned in very good shows like Red Dwarf what we need is a is a is a quantum oscillator what you mean like this one <laughs> I don't do that okay I'm not a comedy writer um, you know so I want the plot to make sense you know if they if 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 suddenly they need to travel to a, a you know a faraway destination all the characters should be thinking damn that's a long way away how the hell are we going to survive that journey rather than it'll be fine we'll just go three times faster than normal you know I don't want to do that okay um you know they they need yeah you know, we need to operate with the constraints that we've set up that's very very important um are there some basic questions you run the plot through to find plot holes through um I, I think that the key one is does it make sense for it's always does it make sense for that character to be doing this at this time what is that character thinking right now what are they trying to achieve um you know so if it doesn't make sense for them to be doing that um there's something wrong with the plot i you know if you take an example okay well why why is that character suddenly deciding that they need to go to that planet I said, well, they haven't even heard of that planet before. Why would they want to go there? How would they have heard of it? Um, you know, wouldn't they actually be, actually, you know, that's the last time I want to set foot on a spaceship. I'm never going on a spaceship ever again. Um, yeah, isn't that a more natural reaction? So, you know, if a character has just had a ghastly experience on a spaceship, and, you know, and has finally got back onto the dry land, onto the ground, rather, um, they're not going to want to get back on the spaceship and do another trip. They're going to say, no way, I th yeah, yeah, I'm not going back on the spaceship. Somebody has to come up with a very compelling reason why they'd get back on that spaceship. And that, hopefully that comes through in the dialogue. But basically my acid test is, does it make sense for that character to be doing what they're doing or planning to do the next thing that they want to do at that point in time? Does it make sense? Does it feel natural? I, does, it, does, does their motivation for what they're about to do feel like it's real? Or is it, am I just driving the plot forward and making their motivation match what I need, where I need to go? Because if I am, I'm not doing something right. Um, so that, that's kind of my acid test, I suppose. Whilst you're playing, do you ever try out a proof of concept style chapter just to see how these characters and technologies? Yes, I do. That is a very good question, um, uh, Feather of the Crow. Yes, I do. I have written scenes um, in my stories that I don't always use. So in every, in every let me just show you, in every 
book I write. Um, and here we go. Uh, here's, all, here's, here's all my books, actually. There's quite a few. So if we look at Elite, Elite Dangerous, for example, so Reclamation is the one we're currently in, um, there is a file uh, in every single one. Let's see if I can find it. It'll probably be in first draft. I don't know where I might have put it, actually. Where's the original? <laughs> Where's the draft? There it is. Um, first draft, OK. Um, there's In every single one of my books, there is a not used .docx file. OK, there's a not used .docx file. And in there, I write, I sometimes write test scenes. I also stick in there anything I cut, any major scenes I cut. This is a, this is a golden rule for anybody writing a book. Never, never throw anything away, OK? The amount of disk space is, is negligible nowadays. And even years ago, it was negligible. Nowadays, it's, it's a trivial. OK, even the entire book is like just a few megabytes. So don't worry about wasting space on your disk drive, OK? Um, if you write something, never delete it. OK, just stick it in a file of not used, because you never know there might be something useful in there in the future. But I often write test scenes um, uh, just to sort of see. And sometimes that helps me develop the characters in particular. OK, so um, one of the early things that I worked out with Elite Reclamation actually was in the original, original story, um, Kahina uh, and Hassan were the other way around. So Kahina was Hassan and Hassan was Kahina. So Hassan was actually the third son, or you know, the, the third child, actually he had two elder sisters, um, third son of the, the senator. And he was the privileged posh one. Uh, and Kahina was going to be the kind of naive space adventurer uh, with, a, with a busted up ship. Um, and when I wrote it originally, I thought it, it's kind of OK, but um, she was way too close to the kind of um, feisty young space heroine kind of trope that I was trying to avoid. And I kind of thought, I don't like the way this is going. Um, so I tried it the other way around and I rewrote the scenes. I basically did a cut and paste on Kahina and Hassan and changed all the he's to she's and all the she's to he's and basically turned her into this spoilt brat. And Hassan then became the naive space pilot. And it just felt better. It just worked better. Um, um, and so that that's that's an, you know, I, and I rewrote the scenes and tested it and it actually turned the change the characters around. So um, things like that do happen to me. Uh, sometimes at quite a late stage, um, so you know it's not set in stone, uh, but sometimes you know things like that, that that do occur. So yeah, I do write test scenes in particular to help me flesh out the characters. What are these characters like? I just basically stick them in a room. Okay, uh, I stick them in a room, basically get them to argue about something. That that tends to be me the work, way I work best. So um, in some of the early prototyping work, there was basically scenes. The, the oldest scene for those of you who know the story. Um, there's a, there's a scene basically where Salome is in the the pod basically, and she wakes up having lost her memory. She doesn't know who she is, and Hassan is the one who finds her. Um, and he basically gets her out of the pod, but because she doesn't know who she is, she basically sort of totally and utterly disorientated and doesn't um, uh, you know is 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 thrashing around, scared and, and and upset and you know completely bewildered. That scene is the oldest scene in. Elite Reclamation. I did actually write that one before the rest of the story, just to basically say, how do my two key characters interact the first time they meet? Um, and so that's actually the oldest scene in the book. That's the first bit I read. I just thought I want to write that to see how it works. And that helped me flesh out how the characters are to, to get, gonna, kind of going to work. So the book kind of ends up writing itself. I suppose it does. Um, uh, Drew, you have something of a track record now of the main character being female. Do you have to force yourself to make the main character a man? So I've, um, I like to have, I, I don't know if I always make the main character. I, 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 I shy away from main, to be honest. Um, I've got major characters. Um, is Kahina the main character in this story? Um, you could argue that she's the most significant character. Is she the main character? Um, she has about the same amount of time as all the other four. So I would argue that there's a mix. I try and always keep a mix. I do like to have notable female characters. Um, and I try and avoid the, you know, oh, rescue me, I'm a princess sort of thing. <laughs> I like to have strong independent characters, but I always write my stories 
and as I've alluded to here, that the gender doesn't really matter to me too much. Um, you know, obviously, you know, take away some of the description and take away the, the he's and the she's. Um, the gender doesn't matter too much. This way. What I'm trying to make sure is the characters are believable. So I have, and I did with Shadewood actually. So if you know Shadewood, there are three main characters in Shadewood, the three primary characters, uh, who ended up being two, two females and one male. Um, I originally wrote them without any gender pronouns at all to just sort of make them happen. And then the gender came along quite late again in the, you know, in the, in the way those characters kind of came about. And I, what I do is I just sort of sit back and I sort of just, yeah, as I'm listening to these characters develop, does that sound more feminine or does it sound more masculine or does it, does it really matter? And I, I sometimes sort of then assign the gender just on basically, how does it feel to, to, to do this sort of thing after I've written those sort of test scenes? Um, so, um, and I don't really like the, this whole, you know, protagonist antagonist thing. That's a, that's a good one, uh, Glenn, as well. Um, so basically, it's just a bunch of people with agendas. So I try and avoid the kind of good guys, bad guys sort of thing. Is Kahina a protagonist? Well, she's a woman who is very selfish. She's a woman who turns out to be out for herself. She deliberately stitches up her older sisters. She defies her father. Um, she starts a war and um, she executes somebody at knife point without a trial, okay? Um, is that a protagonist? <laughs> I don't think that is. Is that an antagonist? You, you know, so I was trying to write these characters as people you would sometimes think, yay, go Kahina, and then sometimes you're like, ugh, I don't like her at all, what's she doing? Um, and the same with Dog, whose side is he on? And Hassan, you idiot Hassan, what are you, you stupid fool, what are you doing? That's a stupid thing to do. Um, Octavia maybe is more of an antagonist, but she's only trying to achieve something. And she doesn't, she's basically taking, her, you know, Octavia's viewpoint is, um, I don't, I don't care about anybody else. Everybody else is disposable. I just want to achieve this thing. And that's, that's my view on the world. Um, and Luco is just, I mean, maybe is Luco a good guy or has he actually got some other agenda in mind? You know, you, the reader, make your own mind up about that. Are they antagonists and protagonists? I'm hoping that you're not entirely sure which side of the fence all of those characters sit on. Um, um, I've heard people, I've heard some people say don't have more than one protagonist. You see, yeah, so I, you know, I I've heard all of these rules and I go, yeah, well, I'll just write what I want. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't, I try and ignore these rules. I try, I must admit, you know, there's, there's, there's things like that. You know, don't have too many, you know, specific cast, don't have it a tank, too many protagonists. Uh, make sure you write within your genre guidelines and all that sort of thing. Just, just, just write the story you want to write, okay? If it's successful and people like it, then you've done a good thing, right? Um, so those, those sort of, yeah, all the rules are there to be broken, as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, that's, you know, sensible things. Let's, you know, let's make sure we can write English. Let's make sure we know a bit about grammar. That's all, that's all useful stuff. Okay, we shouldn't break the rules there too much. Uh, but in terms of how many characters, should you have a, should you have a balance of genders? Should you have a balance of diversity? Should you have this, did you have that? Write the story you want to write, okay? Don't be, don't be hamstrung by everybody else's perceived expectations of what good looks like. Um, choose to, you know, write the story that you want to write. Um, so, uh, I don't do good versus evil. I, you know, in my experience of life, um, all of us are, uh, are, you know, on our day, we're okay, yeah? <laughs> but we, we are, we're all a bit dodge, really, aren't we? Let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> um, you know, we're, 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 none of us are pure and innocent and good. You know, some of us, some of us are, uh, you know, are quite evil at times. I mean, I could be quite evil at times. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, on my day I'm okay, but <laughs> I do lapse. You know, I'm not I'm not perfect. Um, so, and and I think people are just people, okay. So, you know, in in my shade wood, I've got a, a different set of characters. I've got one who is very quite bitter and twisted, and um, you know, indoctrinated, shall we say? You know, maybe that's not her fault, but that's how she's ended up. Uh, another one who's quite a lot more caring, but a bit more fragile, and then very, very, very single-minded when she gets, you know, gets a bit between the teeth. Uh, another one, you know, the, the male character who's totally into his 
his his tech and his his knowledge and you know sort of everybody else what they're doing um you know etc 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 and you know these are the i just try and get people so you know watching what people are like you know some people are just totally narcissistic and that's that's just the way they are some people are very very selfish that's just how they are some people are you know you know signaling their virtue at all possibilities you know they, they like to be seen to be doing good things but they only like to be seen to be doing their good things while somebody else is watching them you know people have flaws right <laughs> um, and I think if you can grab those and stick them into your characters, it just makes them more relatable because nobody wants a, you know, the, the ghastly, Ma what, what, what writers call a Mary Sue, I, or, a, or a Gary, what's, it, what's, the, what's the male equivalent of a Mary Sue? I can't remember. Um, there, is a, there is a phrase. Anyway, Mary Sue is a character who's basically just perfect in every possible way. You know, they always win. They always, <laughs> they always look beautiful. They're always nice. You know, they're always perfect. They've always got the best clothes. You know, you don't want to have Mary Sue's or Gary Fives or whatever they're called. Um, Gary Stu, there we go. <laughs> Peter Perfect. You don't want those. Nobody wants those characters in the book. Okay, you want people with flaws. So, um, like I said, Kahina starts a war. Um, you know, she murders somebody without trial. Um, she, you know, gets her sisters into all sorts of trouble. Yeah, she's she's not nice. Okay, she just isn't nice. Um, <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't want to hang out with her. Um, does she learn something through the story? Yes, she does. She learns to be. Yeah, she learns that. Yeah, you if you just make snap decisions, bad things can happen. She, you know, she realizes that she did start the war and she doesn't want to be in that position again. She regrets what she did. And that makes her maybe a slightly better person by the end of the story. Um, you know, all those sort of things. So that's the other thing about your characters. Have an arc, okay? Do they get better? Do they get worse? Do they actually learn something about themselves? Do they have relationships with other people? What does that look like? You know, one of the things I specifically avoided in Elite Reclamation is I didn't want any romance, okay? I basically said that's going to be a big no-no for this book. I don't want any romance in it because it's you know for for, for, the, for the length of the book and the, and the subject matter it was just going to be a, distri a distraction from the sort of spaceships and, and everything else that was going on in the politics so I, I i left myself there was a tiny bit of um kind of um i suppose you know um um i don't know sort of <laughs> love making scenes from some of the minor characters but it was only there just for effect uh, nothing that was significant relationship wise for any of the major characters so um you know that's that was the decision i made now in shadewood um i had a lot more time to play with i.e four books rather than just the one and so i could i could put that sort of longer term relationship into the character and it became a very important the character arc as a result so you can plan those things in if you want to do those kind of things um you know, this is why I don't like genres. Is it a romance? Kind of, yeah. Is it science fiction? Yeah, kind of. Is it fantasy? Yeah, kind of. Is it a political story? Yeah, kind of. Uh, it's like, what genre is it? I have no idea. I didn't invent genres. That's your problem. Um, so, you know, and, you know, do characters, you know, do some characters start off good and become bad? Well, it depends on your definition of bad and good and evil and all those kind of things. Uh, in my experience, most people think they're the good guy okay and i try and write that perspective from from the characters now you know so take kahina as far as she's concerned she's you know she's lady kahina okay she has a title she has a right you know she is the only person left in that family and that family name owns that moon it's her moon she's going to get her moon back you know it's hers you know, and anybody who's not is basically in her way is doing something illegal which is true she has a right a legal right to reclaim the moon uh, so she's going to do that because that's clearly the right thing to do, right? Um, Dolk has a previous claim to the moon. He's trying to, you know, and, and Kahina doesn't know about this because she's not been told about it. Uh, Dolk has a previous claim to the moon. He was one of the original settlers before these Imperials even turned up. So he's basically saying, no, my people, the oppressed people before you guys turned up, have a right to this moon. That's his plan. He thinks he's in the right. Hassan's just trying to make a pile of cash. All he wants in the universe is a great big pile of cash. Uh, he's not going to look too closely at how he assembles that pile of cash as long as he can get away with it. That's what he's trying to do. Octavia, she just wants to live forever, effectively, okay? She wants more life, you know, and that's kind of, you know, what she's trying to do. Um, and Luco, he just wants an easy life, okay? He just, I just want to kick back and, and tool around the universe in my spaceship. Is that too much to ask? You know, so they're all just doing what they do, okay? They're not 
good, they're not bad, they're just trying to do what they do. And that's the way I'd point put my characters together, to try and make them as believable as, as possible. Um, but in order to make the story work, okay, um, I make sure I write out how, how every, all those dynamics kind of, um, 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 you know, kind of, kind of, kind of pull together. Uh, Luca just wants to fly free and tell Jack, he, he does, you know, he's, he says, I've got my Cobra, I've got my perfect ship, I just want to do what I do. And, it, you know, that got wrong because other people get in the way, okay? Other people get in the way. That's, that's the problem that uh, all the characters have to wrestle with. Other people get in your way, um, which, which is good. Now, there's one more piece which is very important. Okay, it's something that you will need if you take your book to an agent or a publisher. Okay, now if you self-publish, you don't need to worry about this one so much. But the next bit is very, very important if you want to pitch your book to somebody. And that is something called the synopsis. Okay, the synopsis. Now that synopsis is a separate piece of work. The synopsis is what you write after you've written the book. Okay. The synopsis is, and, and, a, and a good rule of thumb, is it must fit on one piece of A4, or, or, or letter, as the Americans would say. We do. All the Americans go, what's an A4? <laughs> uh, basically one piece of paper, okay, a letter uh, in, 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 the, in the US, an A4 in, the, in Europe. Um, your synopsis is a summary, okay, it's it's um, a synopsis is basically a teaser. No, it's not. Okay, this is an important distinction. A synopsis is not a teaser. A teaser is a separate thing. A teaser is there to hype up and make you want to watch the thing. Okay, uh, a teaser would on a, on a book is like the back blurb. Okay, why would I want to read this book? You know, uh, it's a really exciting dynamic space battle between the opposed forces of the Federation and the Empire, and one lady is caught between the two extremes, fighting to reclaim her moon. Okay, that's not brilliant, but that's a back blurb. That's a teaser. Okay. That is not what a synopsis is. A synopsis is a unemotional, not hypey, um, a basically a, this is the absolute basics of what happens in the story with no hype, no excitement, nothing, okay? Um, it's basically summarize the entire story as unemotionally as you can from beginning to end on one piece of paper. That's basically what a synopsis is. Um, okay, so my synopsis is, the year is 3300, Prism's an isolated system. The system's strategically important. It's ruled by an imperial family. Uh, that rulership is unstable. The patrons aren't happy with it. They want to put a puppet ruler in, in place. Um, stuff happens, stuff happens, stuff happens, stuff happens. Uh, things get rapidly worse. Um, I didn't manage to get this, you can say, I didn't get managed manage to get this onto uh, one page, so this is a bad synopsis. <laughs> um, uh, stuff happens, stuff happens, stuff happens. Slomi eventually returns, kills the Reclamus, takes power for herself, but then hands it over to the Imperial Ambassador. Her final act is turning on Dolk and killing him for manipulating her. She leaves for the frontier in the following year. Boom. That's what happens in the story. Okay. So absolutely, yes, spoilers. Absolute total spoiler-tastic, this uh, synopsis. The synopsis is basically telling your agent stroke publisher this is the story, okay? Really, really quickly. This is what happens. Um, so it's total spoilers. There's no subterfuge in this piece of text. This is, this is what happens. You know, you can put the unbeknownst to the Kahina. You know, you can put those sort of things into the synopsis, um, and uh, it should be as short and as sharp as you can make it. Absolutely no extraneous detail in it whatsoever. So it's basically a kind of an abbreviated plot. Yeah, it's, 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 it's basically only the elements of the plot that really matter to the story. Um, so if there's any, you know, there's any uh, <laughs> seven point type to make it fit, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes that is necessary. Um, but yeah, as short and condensed as you can make it, only the absolute essentials of the plot. The synopsis is something you will probably find if you do want to submit your story to an agent or a publisher. They'll basically say, give us a synopsis and the first three chapters. That's, that's usually what you get asked um, when you want to submit a story for, um, um, you know, for, for publication, for, for consideration. 
Uh, what about synopsis written first and fill that for the bot? Well, what tends to happen is with me, I mean, you can do it that way, Glenn. Uh, what happens with me is I work out the detailed plot and then as I'm writing it, I will make tweaks to the detailed plot. Uh, so, I'm, for example, I'm currently doing that with my Higara series, the first book I'm reading, as I'm tweaking little bits as I go and thinking, actually, it works better. And that's the creativity part. I mean, as you write it, you think, mm, yeah, maybe it works better if I do it this way. And so I might say, OK, let's let's move the plot around a bit, make that little that section happen earlier and then move the thing. The overall plot is kind of staying the same. But as the writing proceeds, sometimes you make modifications to the detailed plot. So I recommend that you write the synopsis when the book is done and dusted. It is a summary of what ended up in the book, not a summary of the plot that you started with, if that makes sense. Uh, so the synopsis should be exactly what happened in the book when the book was finished. Whereas the detailed plot is more of a guide for writing the book in the first place. So hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so you basically, yeah, you don't have to rewrite the synopsis. The synopsis is the summary of what you ended up with. Um, and then keep it, OK, because um, yeah, even if you don't decide to do a sequel to your novel, um, you've got the possibility because you've got all the detail of what you did <laughs> um, um, in the future. And and if you want to convert to audiobook, now making audiobooks, that will be a subject in its own right at some point. OK, we'll do a stream on audiobooks um, because that's that's an entirely different kettle of fish. But, you know, having the detail about the background to your book um, is useful if you do want to head for a sequel that you maybe didn't initially anticipate because you can then pick up the story threads from where you left off. Um, and also, if you do convert it to an audiobook, you've got a lot of the detail in there in order to make it go into an audiobook. Um, now, depending on how much detail you want to do, depends on how your process works. I'm a very, very detail-focused person. I have to do this to, to, to meet my own quality standards, OK? I can't. I find it very difficult to accept things when it's kind of like, yeah, well, that'll do. We'll just chuck in a, you know, a MacGuffin there and, and the spaceship. Well, it's about that long and it's about this big and you can stick six people on it. And oh, yeah, it could definitely carry 100 tons of cargo. That's absolutely fine. Um, no, we've got to go back. OK, hang, hang on. What's this ship? Yeah, does, this, does it make sense to have a freighter that does that? Does it make sense to have a small escort ship? You know, where is that getting its fuel from? You know, I need to go through some of that detail. Um, one, one of the other rules of thumb, actually, uh, that um, you mentioned in terms of how do you check these little things. I go f If I've got a particularly difficult plot point that I really want to make sure I've got right, you can also use the five whys, OK? Um, so, um, you know, the five whys is basically ask yourself a why question five times about the thing that you're concerned about. So, OK, so Kahina's going to the space station. Why? Well, she's going there because she wants to use it as a staging post to take over the planet. OK, why? Well, she wants to get the planet back. Why? Well, she's 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 you know, she feels as she's owed the planet because her family, her family, um, um, her family owns it legally. Why? Well, because they they bought the mining rights back in 2250. If you can do five whys, for the, you know, for, the, for, for the motivation of your character to be doing the thing that they're doing, you're probably good. OK, that's my acid test is the five whys. OK, um, <laughs> so be a jerk to review to your own plot. Exactly. Why? Why are they doing that? And then ask them again, why? If you can if you can go down to five levels of why, I feel you've probably got a plot that's probably making sense. OK, if you get stuck at like two or three and you go, I have no idea why they're doing this. You haven't got you have there's something missing. OK, there's something missing in your plot um, because, it, you know, the character motivation isn't strong enough. OK, you're, you're, you know, Delilah. <laughs> I know. What? Why? Why? Delilah. Um, anybody under the age of <laughs> 40 probably going, what? What? Um, um, and if you get to why number six, you can just say, because I'm writing the damn thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, so the why test is a good one. Okay, why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? And why are they doing that thing? If you can get down five levels of why, I think your 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 character's doing something sensible. Most people don't think that far in real life, so you're probably safe. Um, so if that makes sense. So that's that's how I plan my books. Okay, um, I've got a very similar one for um, Shadewood that I did. So for those of you who know my Shadewood saga, um, I've got that here. 
Shame we're talking about Gandhi. How big is that one? See, this is this is enormous by comparison. Um, uh, Seventeen thousand words. Okay, so that was that's because that's four books worth. Okay, um, but you know I've got prehistory, later history, present time, general description. I've got description of, because this my own novel didn't have any world building prior to when I started. I had to do all the world building myself, and we'll cover world building in, a, in another stream. But you know, so here's all the flora, here's all the fauna, here's all the occupations of the people, here's the technology that's available, here's how the measurements work, here's how the time works, here's a, here is the plot for each of the separate books, okay? Um, here are all the main characters. There's, a, there's more main characters because it's four books. Here's all the secondary characters. There are loads of them because you know there's a massive supporting cast of secondary characters, etc., etc., etc. Okay, so uh, Shadewood was a much, 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 much bigger project than Elite Reclamation was. Um, just you know, took me long time. So yeah, so seventeen thousand words, and I haven't actually written any of the books. <laughs> that's and 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 don't don't feel intimidated by that and feel that you've got to reach that. Okay, that's just what I find necessary to do the job. Um, uh, your mileage, as they say, will vary. But um, what I would you know encourage you, I suppose, is to have a look at how much pre work you do need to do to make your novel feel a little bit more solid. Because one of the feedbacks I've I've always had from my novels is there's two things I always, always get. How do you get some, you know, the, the, two of the observations I always get at conventions and in, in the reviews that I actually have for my work on Amazon and stuff is, your characters are really, really good. How do you get your characters so interesting and different from each other? You know, it's basically, you know, a lot of background work. And the other thing is, um, you know, your world just seems really believable as if it's a real place that you know you could you could live in or go to or inhabit i can so imagine it being a place that, that that exists and i feel that can only come from you know really spending some time working on the integrity of the plot and the background work that goes into creating the novel in the first place i feel you can write a perfectly good novel by panstering i i don't i don't you know i'm not saying that you can't do it Okay, um, I think if you want to make something very complicated that has what I suppose would call self-referential integrity, i.e. you look at one bit of it and it always matches up with the rest of the environment and it makes sense, um, you need to do some planning. You need to do some planning. Um, that's how I've found it. That's how, <laughs> how I make it work. Um, so that's the sort of structure of things. So, um, so, so anyway, um, um, that, that, that's kind of enough for me. If, if there are any other questions I haven't answered, please chuck them in the chat now, um, because I've been obviously waffling on for a couple of hours on that sort of thing. But that's that's how I structure everything. So you know, if, if you've got any questions, please chuck them in. Anything that you want to know about that, um, about the, the the novel itself or the, the process or anything else that kind of goes in there. So I'm more than happy to answer any questions um, about just you know the thing. It's it's not a it's not a simple thing. I don't think structuring a book. Um, you know, um, and that's before you get onto the mechanics of doing it, i.e., you know, timing and deadlines and and all sorts of things. We'll we'll talk a little bit on a, another stream about you know the draft and then the, the editing and then the next draft and the beta readers and all that sort of actual mechanics of writing a book. That's a different topic as well. This is kind of pre that, if that makes sense. Stephen King is apparently a panster, and he guess he's done very well. He might even get bigger. Yeah, <laughs> so so I mean, some people can do it. I, I just can't. I, ca I can't hold enough of that in my head simultaneously in order to, to do justice. So I have to write it down for my own sanity, otherwise I'd go mad trying to keep it in my head. So that might be a limitation of my brain more than anything else. If you can keep all that in your head, fair play. Um, so, um, yeah, but uh, I can't. So I have to write it down. Um, still unsure how to know what to cut from ideas and to narrow it down. It's... Yeah, it's um, it's difficult. I mean, I I cut things out of mine. I do it very reluctantly because I'm you know like most writers. But I wrote that; it's brilliant. Um, and sometimes you, it doesn't help the story. Does it? Does it move the story on? I suppose is the question. You know, if it's if it's just filler, that you know you're not achieving anything particular other than the passage of time by the scene. I suppose you can always ask yourself: Does it need to be there? Or can you just imply that it happened? Um, you know, I've had um, places in my story where I have had the characters hanging around the, you know, the proverbial campfire, right? But there's usually a point to that 
thing. So, for example, there's a scene in Shaywood where they're all sitting around the campfire having a meal. But the, the purpose of the scene is to basically bring one of the characters into the crew and basically welcome her in and say, look, all is forgiven, now you're one of us. That's the purpose of the scene. And they do that through having a meal. Okay, So the meal is the kind of the kickback kind of thing and then the slightly more serious conversation happens. That scene is basically get that girl into the group and get her forgiven by the rest of the team so they can move on to the next scene. That's the purpose of the scene. But it is a bit more gentle and it's a bit more flowy. Now, if they, were, if they just literally sat around the campfire and had a meal, I could kill that scene because what's the point? I don't need it. It's not doing anything. They're just having a meal. But if the meal means something, it is important. So that's those are the sort of criteria I use for cutting out scenes. Um, uh, kill your darlings is a horrible thing. Yeah, sometimes you have to kill your characters as well. That that gets people upset. Um, uh, the conclusion of Shadewood would be hard to get to unless it be in thought of in advance. And that that is my point. Is that, you know I had planned that. I knew. For those of you who know what happens at the end of Shadewood, if you haven't got that far, then no spoilers. I, I won't. I won't spoil it here. But you know, to do what I did at the end of Shadewood had to be planned. I knew who was going to live and who was going to die right from before I started writing the first book. Um, so, um, so you know, so that, that's the thing. Um, one of the things my suffered for book for uh, Jan, one of the things my book suffered from was too many ideas, and Drew told me no one said them. I did, didn't I? That's right. So, what do you think of this, Drew? Well, <laughs> I think you've got some great ideas, but your biggest problem is there's too many of them. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, you know, you know, in that particular one, uh, Jan, you had you had like three books worth of ideas in one book, and it was just too too much. Okay. Um, and um, you know your book was by far the stronger when you you know expanded it into a, into a series, which is which is a great thing to do. Um, uh, some things I've struggled with is not is not cutting down scenes so much, but choosing between two background motivations for a character that I like both of them. And yeah, that can only come with um, ultimately deciding what kind of person your character is. I suppose um, it's it, it it is a tough one. It is a tough one. So so there we go. Anyway, my friends, I will I will bid you adieu. And um, a, a Drew? No, a Dew. <laughs> and let you go back to whatever you're going to do. Um, thank you very much for your time. I hope you found that um, you know, a little bit interesting, a little bit uh, uh, you know, uh, into, insight into the way I do my writing. Um, and um, uh, you know, I hope you extracted something useful from it. It's, it's a way of doing it. This is not the only way to do it. OK. Um, you know, there are lots and lots of other perfectly reasonable ways to do it. This is this is the way I do it. I find it works very, very well for a complicated novel or a complicated series of novels. Um, it will be complete overkill for some novels. Um, might not be sufficient for others. So, um, but there we are. Take care, my friends. Have a good week ahead. I will see you on Thursday for some No Man's Sky. Friday is Star Citizen. Saturday is, of course, um, uh, the amazing Beyond the Frontier. Um, and... Uh, We'll, we'll see how that goes. And then obviously back to more writing stuff next week as well. Take care. Look after yourselves. Have a fantastic week ahead. And I will see you soon. Always, always write on. <laughs> Take care, my friends. And see you soon.